Welcome everyone. Nice to see you all, those joining us in person and online. My name is Scott Drummond and I'm the Program Manager of Victorian Alcohol and Drug Association, VADA. I'd like to welcome our Emergency Department Clinical Liaison Addiction Network folk, our non-residential withdrawal nurses, and also other AOD clinicians who are joining us today in person or online. May I start by acknowledging country. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge that this land was never ceded. I would also like to acknowledge and celebrate people and their families and supporters who have a lived and living experience of alcohol, medication and other drug use. We value your courage, wisdom and experience and recognise the important contribution that you make to the AOD sector in Victoria. All right, before I do a little preamble around our toolkit top-up event, we're going to try and go to a, um, a Mentimeter uh, platform to enable more engagement with those online and in the room using your phones to answer questions and, and engage with questions. We're nearly there. All right, so by now I take it that we've got 42 online, 42 have connected at least with Mentimeter. If you could have any superpower, which one would you choose? And what Mentimeter is doing is taking the most common responses and putting them in a word cloud. So most of the people seem to want teleportation, flying and mind reading. I do quite like being able to sleep, but be on time. Willpower, I can relate to willpower. And so it's really quite a useful tech, a useful platform for gauging and, in, and understanding some of the common responses or typical responses to questions. And we'll also use Mentimeter today to field questions from the room. All right. We've, in one word, how do you feel about today's event? And as more and more responses come in, you'll see that the words are highlighted and bold. So excited, I'm pleased to hear that. Good, interested, curious, happy, networking, positive, pleased, optimistic, and curious. Great. I appreciate that very much. All right. Uh, hang of that. And I think that's all our warm up questions. And we'll use more of those throughout the day. And also to, as I say, field questions for our speakers. So it makes it easier for us all to engage with the speakers and for us all, in fact, to see questions that might be coming forward. All right, this is the second year Varda and Dana has hosted the toolkit top up event. I'd like to thank Indivior for supporting the event too. It is much appreciated and thank you to Susanna. Our toolkit top up event includes a series of presentations from the academic to clinical, to practical, all we hope interesting and informative. Last year, for example, Dr. Tatiana Rox delivered a memorable presentation on nutrition and AOD, nutrition-based approaches to preventing and treating mental disorders. Today, we have four quite different, but very interesting presentations delivered by preeminent and highly qualified speakers. Our first is titled, The Only Way Out Is In, Addictions, Trauma and Psychedelics by Dr. Ellie Kotler. This will be followed by our next presentation on the emergence and implications of opiate containing Ayurvedic medicine, Kamini Vidruan Ras, presented by Dr. Philippe Naren. After lunch, Terry Strike and Adam Searby will talk on exploring a reduction in NSP use in the context of the introduction of an additional led long acting injectable bute program. And then our last presentation is on medicinal cannabis 
describing as a nurse practitioner for AOD clients with Simone O'Brien, an interesting and informative program, and I hope you enjoy it. Today's sessions will also be live streamed, as you can tell, and a link to the recording will be available after the session. So I'll now hand over to Daniel Eltringham, who will be the MC for our first session today. Thanks, Daniel, and welcome. Thanks, Scott. Okay, so um, our first presenter we have is Dr. Ali Kotler. I've got to apologise, Ali. I, as I talked about before, um, and it was funny with the favourite book thing that came up. My favourite book has always been by an um, author called Eli Wiesel, who is actually called Ali. So I apologise. That's why I messed up your name, even after I was introduced here. So Ali is a consultant psychiatrist and the medical director of Melbourne Private Hospital, Australia's only standalone addiction hospital, where he's overseen the design and implementation of treatment program based on humanistic and psychodynamic principles, with a particular focus on trauma and adverse childhood experiences. An adjunct lecturer at Monash University, Ali oversees medical students on their addiction medicine rotation. He is the founding member of the Melbourne Neuropsychoanalytic Group and an AFL Players Association network provider. Ali's extensive research experience includes trauma, AOD, Alzheimer's disease. He is the principal investigator for a trial of MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. He is on the faculty of the Mind Medicine Institute, teaching in a certificate of psychedelic assisted therapies course, and is a board member of Mind Medicine Australia, as well as a member of the Australasian Pro Professional Society on Alcohol and Other Drugs. I welcome Dr. Ali Kotler to speak for us. He did tell me just to introduce him as just a psychiatrist, but I thought I'd do the whole thing. <laughs> thanks, Daniel. Um, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for being here and listening. Um, so just a couple of things I'm going to try and keep, uh, okay, keep going for myself because I want to have time for questions. So this, this talk is is in some ways just representative of my own journey in the addiction space. I didn't come to addictions with any experience in addictions. Like many of you, I didn't have teaching in addictions really in my undergraduate courses and my psychiatric training. And um, I kind of just fell into it. And then, um, so, so I had like no preconceptions, I think, when I just started seeing people with addictions. Um, and then, you know, in my day job, Clinically, I would see people, people with addictions and everyone had trauma and awful things and big emotions that they couldn't control. And then I would like read the literature about dopamine and these Olympic circuits and rats. And I'd just think like, this doesn't really match up. Like, am I missing something here? Or, you know, something's off kind of. There's no real talk between the science and the people. Um, and so that kind of got me just really thinking about what addictions are and and why people get addiction. So this is in a way represent, yeah. So this talk kind of just is like where my mind has gone in the last, I guess, 10 years. And I think once one has a particular understanding of addiction, psychedelics just become an obvious treatment modality that I think will help a lot of people. Um, and hopefully that will all make sense as we go through. Also, I'm just gonna say that I work at Melvin Private Hospital. And if you like this type of model, um, just a shame, absolutely shameless plug. I'm going to leave some Melbourne Private Hospital brochures here if anyone is, you know, interested in working in this type of space, because uh, it's always hard to find good people. So I'm going to leave this. That's my shameless plug. And now I'll get on to talking about what I'm here to talk about. Um, there's obviously too much to talk about. Um, I think I got 40 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and I want to try to leave about 10 minutes for questions. So there's obviously too much to talk about. So I'm just going to gloss over some really important things, but hopefully make some, um, I guess, big main points. Um, 
So a question that I had in my mind for a good couple of years, which, and then I like the answer was so obvious, but, you know, I'd seen a lot of people in other areas, like adults with trauma, and they would present, you know, for help with trauma, you know, so they would someone who went to war or had an awful accident and they would come seeking help because they had trauma. The trauma was in their mind. They couldn't escape it. It was like running through their heads 24 seven and it was like killing them. And they would come for help and say, you know, I've had trauma. Can you please help me? And then, you know, when working with people with addictions, I realized like that pretty much all of them had also had some type of trauma, which we'll define in a second because it's a big word, you know, but like they'd all had awful things happen to them, but they didn't come to me saying, can you help me with my awful experiences in my life? They came saying, I've got an addiction. And so that kind of um, made me think, like, why is that? Like, why do people who have stuff happen to them when they're young, they don't really come seeking help for the bad stuff that's happened. They come seeking help for other things. You know, they're self-harming, they've got eating disorders, addictions. And that really got me thinking as, you know, to why does childhood trauma hide whilst adult trauma is kind of always there? Um, so, you know, what is trauma? I'm sure everyone has their own definitions and this is not to tell you what trauma is. It's just, you know, particular, I guess, lens or angle on trauma. You know, we all have bad stuff happen to us, but sometimes the stuff is so emotionally overwhelming that we can't process it and it kind of just gets stuck in our minds. The psyche can't really integrate it into the personality. It just kind of sticks there. It's almost like our mind doesn't know what to do with it. Um, as kids, you know, the whole attachment theory, some of you might have heard of it and some not, but, you know, it's a very well-known theory in psychology, developmental theory. A lot of our development is based around learning how to process feelings and emotional regulations. Attachment theory is in many ways an emotional regulation theory, so how we grow up. And, you know, as kids, we don't know how to process feelings. It's something you have to learn as a kid, as a human. We all have to learn that we're not born being able to process feelings, which is why when we're kids, we're particularly vulnerable to becoming emotionally overwhelmed. And we, which is why, you know, when we talk about trauma, there's the obvious trauma, you know, some people in, you know, and there's good and bad things to this distinction, but we'll just go with it for now. Big T trauma, you know, when someone comes, you know, they've had, you know, they were sexually abused or something, that's pretty clear that that's going to be emotionally overwhelming for people. But there's a lot of hidden trauma in our society, in our families, in ourselves. You might call that little T trauma. This is a book I'm reading at the moment. You don't have to read this one. This wasn't the one I put down. But um, he, he, he said something that kind of struck me. To the casual observer, such he's talking about families where a lot of mental illness came out of the family. Um, and he said, uh, this is Joseph Burke, who was a psychoanalyst. He said, to the casual observer, such families may be paragons of moral civil rectitude. But once their facade is brushed aside, generations of shit come pouring out. So I just, uh, that's a bit of an intense quote, but I just, I liked it because it's a bit intense. Um, but I think you can probably connect to what I'm saying. Like, you know, you meet a lot of people and they say, oh, my childhood was great. You know, I was went to private school and I had holidays and I got a bike. But you start digging under the surface and a lot of, you know, shit can come pouring out, which is really quite hidden, even to the person themselves, they, until they start reflecting on it. Um, you know, how, what, what was their emotional experience during childhood? And so trauma is not, I would suggest, not just these big, scary things. Trauma is the sort of stuff that we all have with us that, you know, come from generations of, you know, suffering and hiding and et cetera. Um, but so these experiences, whether they're big T traumas or little T, you know, little T, you know, patterns in our relationships with our parents who themselves have unprocessed trauma, um, it, it, you know, trauma really happens, I would suggest, <clears throat> when, you know, the container that you have for your feelings and the feelings coming in, coming in are mismatched. So, you know, you just can't hold the feeling of the, the experience triggers in you. Um, and these parts of us, they get stuck. So they're always there. But the important thing about childhood trauma, coming back to what I was saying, the, the question I asked initially, is that the difference between childhood trauma and adult trauma is that, that a child, when we're young, our personalities will literally develop around the trauma. They will develop to hide the trauma 
from ourselves. So that that pain that's sort of ever present, our personalities will all develop around that pain. And it will ultimately lead to that pain being hidden from ourselves and other people. Um, and that is all types of things. You know, it's I don't like putting people in boxes, but we all do it. So let's just do it. So, you know, personality disorders, which is a terrible name for the thing itself, is, is exactly that. It's the person's personality developed in a particular way with particular compulsive patterns of their thoughts, feelings and behaviours that are really protective for them. They worked at a particular when the kid was seven and being abused, you know, it, it worked to them to split between good and bad and see the world as black and white. That's how they stayed alive. Um, and, you know, so these patterns um, hide the trauma within us. And the patterns are always compulsive. You know, that's the thing about these patterns. They're compulsive because the mind is using it to protect me from my pain. And so when those compulsive patterns come out as behaviours, than their addictions. And so to me, that's what an addiction is. And it's trauma, like literally, it's 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 the person mind using their behavior to help them hide their own trauma, which they haven't had the opportunity to process. Um and it hides, you know, that's the, the, the addiction hides the trauma. So people don't present with childhood abuse saying I was abused as a child. They'll present with an addiction or some other way that they're more. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's going. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. And other people. Did I just hear something? Or am I hearing voices? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to put in here as well that um, it's a difference between one significant difference between what you might call depth psychology and non-depth psychology is that um, depth psychologies appreciate or I guess it would suggest that there are unconscious motivations to our behaviours. So a lot of people that I meet with addictions are not aware initially that their addictions are motivated by unprocessed feelings or feelings that are too big for them to process due to um, things that happen to them earlier in life. But you kind of scratch under the surface and you poke around a bit and all of a sudden, you know, they can start to make the connections. Um, so trauma. So what is trauma? So I would say trauma is unprocessed, uh, you know, feelings, you know, relating to some event that plays out in compulsive ways. Um, so what are addictions? I think this is the most important question we, as people that work with people suffering from addictions, can ask ourselves. And I think we should ask ourselves again and again and again and again and again, because the answer to this question will totally direct how you treat or manage or heal even the language you use to help people with addictions your understanding of addictions will directly inform how you as an individual person you know help try to help someone with an addiction so for me it's the most important question that we can ask um and just to review something that i'm sure everyone um has heard 78 times but, you know, this is sort of how we got where we are. We had, you know, initially these electrodes and they put, they stuck them in rats' brains and into the mesolimbic circuit, so quite deep into the, you know, the older structures of the brain and they were stimulated and, you know, rats kept doing things and doing things and doing things and doing things. And then this, you know, this guy, Roy Wise, came and he said, oh, actually, that that those circuits, they're dopamine circuits. So dopamine um, must do that thing, like the addictive thing. And then we came to this, um, and I'll just use this. Uh, this is a quote from this article. This is a very kind of famous, you know, to me, maybe infamous um, article. So this is this is how the medical model came, that, that addiction is tied to changes in brain structure and function is what makes it fundamentally a brain disease. And I think everyone maybe should focus on that because I think that is absolutely false, but this is the idea. So I'll just say that again because I think this is false, but this is the argument that addiction is tied to changes in brain structure and function, that is the dopamine stuff, is what makes it fundamentally a brain disease. And so then we have the medical model. Um, but it's really important to know that the medical model has tons of problems with it. Um, you know, you could speak for hours just about the problems with the medical model, and it's just a theory, you know, it's not, it's not like a fact, it's just that, you know, this is what some people think. But some of the problems with the medical model are 
the dopamine actually doesn't do pleasure in the brain. It doesn't do the liking bit. It does the motivation bit. So it's like what makes you motivated to do stuff, like it's the drive or desire. But dopamine absolutely does not do pleasure. And that's just scientifically false. So that's, you know, first problem with it. Um, David Nutt wrote a great article about five years ago. He's a professor in, in Imperial College in London. Um, you know, sort of suggesting that there's a lot more going on than dopamine, you know, like to suggest that opiates are addictive because of dopamine is probably pretty stupid because our brain has opiate circuits. So opiates are probably addictive because they're opiates, not because they do you know, something to dopamine. Um, that that these, these so-called pleasure circuits, another massive problem with this theory, these so-called pleasure circuits also underlie fear responses. So, um, in other words, they're motivational circuits. They're not pleasure circuits. So when a rat is motivated by fear, its mesolimbic circuit will also light up. So they're, they're you know, it's obviously not a fear. It, it's obviously not a pleasure system because it's, uh, it's triggered by fear as well. Um, also, the, the, a massive problem with the medical model is that it seems to just ignore... I mean, and this was my problem starting out, that it just seems to ignore the people who have addictions and what's actually going on with them. It just, you know, it's like it doesn't, it's like the trauma doesn't exist. Um, and there are actually possible solutions. So this was nice to see that some people have actually been thinking about this. The one in psychedelic colours is my favourite. That's why I've put that up. Um, but it basically, um, it, it's all, ooh, how do, ooh. Okay, how do I go back? Can I go backwards? Uh, I'll, it is worth saying for, you know, some people um, in particular might be uh, more interested in this than others, but Kent Berridge is the guy that came up with incentive salience. Incentive salience is the current leading dopamine-based, biological, brain-based theory of addiction, and it really has massive problems. And I actually emailed Kent Berridge to ask him, like, you know, and, and a lot of addiction research is based on this um, incentive salience theory, but it's actually it's got massive problems. Um, and if you want to read about the problems, you can read you can read this article. Um, and I actually emailed Kent Berridge and I asked him about his theory. And I was like, this seems to have like pretty significant problems. And to his credit, he emailed back and said, yeah, it does have massive problems, but it's just a theory. And you know, even though a lot of our you know research is based on that theory and it's got a lot of problems, but there are actually other theories. Um, like you can find in this article, for example. Um, and they're based on neuroscientific theories that place emotions at the core of our minds and brains rather than cognitions. I never connected to the models that put cognitions as kind of primary. I always felt that emotions were much more important. Um, and, and, and yeah, so these guys sort of come up with neuroscientific theories that put emotions and experience at the core of our um, brains and minds. And they, so the, the, this is the type of theories that I connect to. This is a really interesting book. It's an alternative to DSM. It's called PDM, and it tends to take a more humanistic and psychological approach to things. And so under their addiction section, they say the most prominent psychodynamic model of addiction interprets addiction as a form of self-medication against dysphoria. So, you know, difficult feelings or disordered mood because an addiction serves a defensive function. It's very hard to stop. In other, in other words, the addiction is helping the person in some way. It's helping them defend from what's intolerable inside them. It ameliorates suffering. But because that relief is only temporary, the person needs to engage again in the defensive behavior of addiction once the relief wears off. Psychoactive drugs <clears throat> help people who misuse substances to tolerate intolerable feelings. You know, which is obviously why some substances are addictive and some substances aren't. The substances that trigger our emotional circuits are addictive precisely because they do that and you know you can eat the leaf off that tree and you won't become addicted because it doesn't trigger our emotional circuits mm -hmm. okay so just quickly to go because because as, as i was suggesting to me what is an addiction is the most important question and so part of my journey i guess for myself has been to understand where i think some we get some things wrong as a scientific community and a clinical community. So I've just put that under myths of addiction. Um, so I think this is a myth that, that addiction is tied to changes in brain structure and function is what makes it fundamentally a brain disease. I think that is absolutely wrong. And that's wrong simply because 
the brain changes are an association, but they, they, that doesn't mean they're causative. In other words, you can have awful experiences when you're young, and we know that those experiences change your brain. So just because there are brain changes doesn't mean it's a brain disease, because those brain changes could be due to the trauma that you suffered as a kid. So that doesn't make sense. You know, it, it's like we learn it, you learn in like statistics 101, just because something's associated doesn't mean it's causative. And so that's just false. Um, and this is the, you know, this is the basis of the medical model, and it's just false, I believe. Um, which is why some people come and look at the brain changes and they say, well, actually, they're not, they're, it's not about a disease. And you get a book like this from a neuroscientist saying, well, it's actually learned behavior. This is, so, this is a behavior that someone has learned probably for a protective reason. Um, and it's not a disease, for example, this book. And then you have all the sort of developmental theories. Um, those are some of my favorite books about addiction, which are pretty good. Um, now, this is a massive, uh, I think, myth that addictions are inherited. So when I, I believed this until a few years ago, I believed that depression was inherited and bipolar was inherited as 50% genetic and all these things. Um, and you can look this up in your own time if you're interested, but addictions are heritable and depression is heritable. They're not inherited and they're, they're a very big difference. And I actually asked the geneticist about this just to double check that I'm right. But it's false to say that addictions are inherited. They're not. There's something called heritable, which means something else. It doesn't mean what we think it means. Um, so addictions are about pleasure, and dopamine is the brain, brain's pleasure molecule. I still hear this spoken about. That's absolutely false, because for 20 years, they've known that dopamine doesn't do pleasure. It does motivation, and it doesn't do pleasure. In other words, you can destroy a rat, not me or you, but some people do this stuff apparently. You can do, one can destroy a rat's dopamine circuits and they still experience pleasure. So dopamine is not pleasure. Um, another interesting thing to think about, you know, can behavior be a disease? It's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, we don't have to think about it today, but you can think about it in your own time. Um, and another myth, maybe the biggest myth of all, is that psychiatric diagnoses are diseases. Um, you know, some, like, you know, because you have a psychiatric diagnosis, it's some type of valid disease entity. It's not, because psychiatric diagnoses are purely descriptive. And that's a really important thing that I learned in my psych psychiatric training, but it seems like a lot of people forget that or never learned it. Um, they're not. They're just descriptions and they're atheoretical. So, um, the DSM is not a list of diseases. It's just a list of categories of symptoms. That's all it is. Um, so psychiatric diagnoses are not uh, diseases in, in any sense. Okay, just to go over the current treatments. Um, so again, this is, I guess, my own personal biases in sort of um, being exposed to the addiction literature and the guidelines. So this is the latest guidelines from the Medical Journal of Australia for alcohol use disorder. They're basically all cognitive behavioral uh, based treatments, except there's motivational interviewing as well. But they're basically behavioral and cognitive strategies and motivational interviewing. So this really, um, I guess, I was gonna say rub me the wrong way, but it doesn't sound so good. It just, I don't know, but then I just said it. I didn't, when I, when I, I started, you know, seeing people with addictions, I started trying to talk to them about their feelings, their experiences as a kid, you know, poking around, what, what's intolerable for them, what, what, what triggers them, and, you know, and then, you know, I see these guidelines that talk about, you know, sort of behavioral strategies and motivational interviewing, and it just didn't, it just didn't fit with me, with what I was doing and what I saw was helpful for people. So then I looked, I actually looked at the evidence, like, because I just didn't really buy that these therapies would be particularly effective for people with addictions. It just seemed to miss the point, which was that these people have overwhelming feelings and emotions and they can't sit with themselves and they need to escape themselves. And, um, you know, that's what I was seeing in front of me. And then, uh, you know, sort of my training in cognitive behavioral therapy and things like that, sort of, it just didn't fit. So then I did actually look at the evidence and the evidence is very interesting. I, I, I learned something very important when I kind of dug into this a little bit more. The evidence that, that 
people use for to make guidelines is based on is based on something called like effective like cbt is effective it's an effective evidence based treatment and effective is a, is an interesting word because it's based on this thing called effect size and effect size is relative so in other words in the studies they'll do cbt versus something else and if it's better than the something else then by definition it's effective and there is evidence that it works but so in 2019 i think it was some uh, some people did a, a really interesting um a really interesting study dividing all the studies of cbt into addictions by what the comparison group was so is it cbt versus nothing is it cbt versus psychodynamic therapy is it like what is what is cbt against because that's how you get an effect size saying that cbt is better than something else so CBT is somewhat better than nothing. So if you have someone on a wait list, CBT is better than having someone on a wait list. So in other words, there are certain studies that show that CBT is effective. That's what you get from that. Um, then that's the second category was in contrast to a non-specific therapy. So literally getting a nice empathetic person to sit with someone with an addiction and compare that to CBT. Um, and the conclusion was the pulled effect size for frequency outcomes at early follow-up was small and, small and statistically significant with a success rate roughly 8% higher than the median within the contrast condition. However, the effect was non-significant at late follow-up. So in other words, after six to 12 months, there's no difference between CBT and, and a nice empathetic person sitting with the person with an addiction. And as soon as you contrast C CBT to any other, if, you know, um, accepted treatment and it has no effect size so essentially at six to 12 months what this study shows is that cbt is no better than a nice empathetic supportive person sitting with the person with an addiction um so that's my thought on current treatments uh which brings us to psychedelics how long have i got okay um so what are psychedelics well most of them are naturally occurring substances um if you're into organic chemistry that will mean something to you if you're not then just ignore it like i do um it's also there are also synthetic um psychedelics like lsd uh, and mdma that's lsd is very similar to serotonin which is important when we talk about the mechanism of action oh went black uh, and MDNA, MDMA is another synthetic um, kind of a psychedelic. Um, so let's talk about how it works. There are different sort of, um, I guess, ways you can, it's like, you know, that elephant thing, you can look at it from different ways. Um, so we'll look at it from different perspectives very briefly. Um, on, a mole ooh, on a molecular, so MDMA is a little bit, ooh, MDMA is a little, ooh, MDMA is a little bit different. Um, MDMA is, is almost the perfect, people describe it as the perfect medicine to help people work through trauma um, because it triggers you, but it also makes you really, really trusting uh, of anyone around you. Um, and so it, it almost sort of like brings up all that scary stuff that you've packed down. Um, but at the same time, you feel really, really, really trusting with, with those people around you. And that's probably the oxytocin that it releases. That's what people think which is a sort of attachment chemical, you know, when, when mothers breastfeed and children and there's like a lot of oxytocin flying around. On a molecular level, um, psychedelics seem to work through serotonin 2A receptors. So you get rid of those receptors, you block those receptors, you don't have a psychedelic experience. And those receptors are in a lot of places, but they're highly concentrated in the cortex. So the newest part of our brain, um and this is what happens on a global network level this is real this is not like someone made a picture the that's your brain on psilocybin which is from you know so-called magic mushrooms and placebo so that's just your brain your brain normally the dots on the periphery of the circle are neural networks talking to each other so our brains when we're not on psilocybin are the placebo one which basically and there, there are the same number of connections on both pictures, 
It's just that we're usually so caught up, you know, me, you, humans, we're so caught up in how the normal way we see the world, our brain just does the same thing over and over and over. You know, I'm a bad person. I'm disgusting. I'm dirty. You rejected me. I hate myself. I hate you. You know, however I see the world, it's just fixed. And psychedelics just make lots of parts of our brain talk to each other that don't usually talk to each other. There are theories, there are excellent theories about how psychedelics work. And in 30 seconds, um, it's about our cortex usually controls how we perceive the world. So it has some top-down um, sort of like um, compressive restraining model on how we interpret the world and ourselves. So, you know, someone who was traumatised when they were young by other people will see rejection and abandonment everywhere because that's what they've learnt about life. It kind of keeps them safe, you know, it's, it's coming, it's coming. I'll reject you before you reject me. And the theory is that that comes from the cortex, these top-down sort of, um, uh, you know, these neural networks that just sort of funnel everything we see through our past experience. And in theory, psychedelics just make that disappear. And so you sort of just see the world for what it is rather than constrained by the top-down neurological, psychological models. On a personal experience, uh, sort of a personal level that people describe um, that have had psychedelic-assisted therapy, this is what people describe. Unconscious traumas come up. All of a sudden, they can feel. You know, they haven't been able to feel for 20 years because of the, their trauma and their minds has numbed themselves. So all of these emotions come up. Conflicts come up, you know, underlying conflicts. I love my mum, but I also hate her, but maybe that's okay, you know, maybe I can do both. Um, so a loss of boundaries, sort of feeling very connected to everyone else and, and everything else. Um, there's flexibility. All of a sudden they can see things in a different way. You know, oh, maybe I'm not disgusting. You know, maybe I feel disgusting because I was abused, but maybe I'm not disgusting. Uh, connectedness, mystical type experiences. So people describe, you know, spiritual type experiences, whatever that means to that person. Um, but that sort of mystical or spiritual feeling of connection and unity. Um, and people develop insight, you know, into themselves and their patterns. Uh, and in playing the English, it just helps people unpack their stuff. Um, a really important thing to understand about psychedelics is that it's the therapy that works. So this is not someone going out into the bush, a bush rave and taking MDMA or psychedelics. It's all about the therapy. So it's psychedelic assisted therapy. It's not treatment with a psychedelic. It's psychedelic assisted therapy. And this is basically how the studies have been um, modeled. You have one or two or three psychedelic sessions and all, each of those sessions is sort of surrounded by a month or two of therapy on either side, because you've got to know what you're going in for. You've got to know what you're, you know, you have a set, you know, I, I want to kind of work through this. And then all this stuff will come up for you during the session. And the sessions can be very difficult. They can be very painful and scary. You know, like I think any good therapy just happens all of a sudden. And then you have a month or two of it's called integration. So you work with a therapist on sort of integrating what's come up for you. And then you have another session. And the studies so far have had two or three psychedelic medicine sessions um, surrounded by psychotherapy. That's the model. So it's the psychotherapy that works. And so far, it's been psilocybin and MDMA, which has the most uh, evidence for it. Um, that bottom quote, I felt like I went through 15 years of psychological therapy in one night. That's this, that's kind of the idea. Um, so there's just quickly to talk about evidence. I'm going to be quick now because I'll we'll just have a few minutes for questions. They're basically, you know, psychedelics were basically stopped in by that guy. Um, there was a lot of research, a lot of research happening in the 60s and 70s, and then it just got, they just got banned. You know, it's the war on drugs, they're bad, they're evil. Um, as David Nutt said, this is the worst censorship of research and medical treatment in the history of humanity. I think he's got a point. 
Um, but there is a lot of research coming up. Probably most the most well-known one in addiction is a small study for alcoholism. One thing to note about research in psychedelics is it's slow because big pharma is not interested because you can't patent these compounds, so they can't make any money from it. So all research basically comes out of universities or charity. You know, the big PTSD studies they've done in the States um, by um, MAPS has been, you know, they had $100 million of donations, MAPS, and that's how they've been able to run these studies because there's no pharma money. Um, anyway, it's looking very positive for addiction in the early uh, studies. And I just want to, and, and that's, again, I think that it all comes back to what you think an addiction is. If you think addiction is a genetic brain-based dopamine disease and what do psychedelics help, I don't know. But if you see addictions as some, you know, as the mind is the mind's way of trying to cope with intolerable internal experiences that the person can't sit with, well, then psychedelics make a whole lot of sense because that's exactly what psychedelics are good at. They're, they're good at helping people try and try and to integrate the parts of them that are too scary or too overwhelming to integrate. I'll just end on, there was an interesting um, conversation between Bill Wilson and Carl Jung, who is a, he's a kind of like a well-known psychoanalyst, Carl Jung, um, talking about um, Bill Wilson's experience with LSD, which is a psychedelic. Um, so some of you will know that Bill Wilson had this spiritual experience, um, which he thought was critical for his own recovery. Some people would say he was on atropine at the time, but whatever. He had a spiritual experience. Uh, he said a price had to be paid for recovery. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. These were revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. I felt lifted up as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. So he had this mystical spiritual experience with people, which people with psychedelics have. Um, he wrote to Jung and he said, LSD is harmless and quite non-addictive. Once in the experience, there's great broadening and deepening and hardening of consciousness. On my first trial several years ago, my original spontaneous spiritual experience was reenacted in wonderful splendor. A gets about 5% recovery rate, but if these alcoholics are first preconditioned by LSD and then placed in the surrounding AA groups, the result is startling. And, and uh, then Jung said, uh, once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. To me, these occurrences are phenomena. So, you know, they're, they're a real thing. And this is, you know, the important bit, I think. They appear to be in the nature of a huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were once the guiding forces of these men, obviously, and other humans, are suddenly cast to one side and a completely new set of conceptions and motives begins to dominate them. And that is the psychedelic experience. And that's what good therapy does as well. Yeah, good therapy does that as well. It can just take 10, you know, 10 years. Um, but this is what psychedelics seem to be able to do. They, they can rearrange how I experience myself, how I see the world, and you know, really um, change that in a powerful way. Uh, and according to you, in such experiences reward the sufferer for the pains from, so it should be from the pains of the labyrinthine way. You know, that, I guess that just stuckness. From now on, a light shines through the confusion more. He can accept the conflict within him and so come to resolve the morbid split in his nature on a higher level. Thanks. I think we've got four minutes for questions. If I should say that they're not addictive. That's something I should say, uh, particularly in the trials. Yet. Have I been to for what? Well, no, I'm joking. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I do. I haven't mentioned that. Um, I, 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 I applied to Victorian. I applied to treat one of my patients with chronic, uh, chronic PTSD uh, with MDMA assisted therapy. The federal government said yes. The Victorian government said no. So, um. Me and some of my friends are taking the Victorian government to court to see if um, I can actually, because that can be challenged, their decision, to see if I can treat my patient with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, because currently in Australia, it's not, it's, you, you can't do it. Um, and that has not happened yet, but it's happening soon. There's been some criticism. Oh, yeah, we just have to Sorry. give them our colleagues online won't yeah. be able to hear you. And then we've also got a question via the uh, yeah. There's been um, some people that have come forward saying that they've experienced further trauma from using psychedelic assisted therapy with mostly people um, that aren't 
trained therapists, I guess, and but some within the trials as well. Um, how do we in this like developing space prevent this from happening, I guess, when it's not yet approved by the TGA? Thanks for that question. Yes, yeah, so there's, I think you're, yeah, so uh, two, two things. One is that, yeah, there was, there, there was uh, apparently sexually abuse, sexual abuse in one of the MAPS trials about five years ago, um, which is obviously awful. Um, and um, sorry, you said something else. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So currently there is, you know, which I don't advocate, but there is a massive underground for people seeking psychedelic assisted therapies. And I think the quickest way to alleviate those risks is to make it legal so doctors and nurses and therapists can do it rather than some underground people that, you know, who know, there's, there's no governing bodies, there's no ethical standards. Um, I think psychedelics are really powerful. You know, in all um, psychotherapies, um, there is an abuse potential. You know, sexual abuse is a, um, and, you know, psychotherapy is inherently a risky business. Um, and, you know, just like um, any other field, we have to be really on top of it. Ethic, ethical bodies and, uh, you know, people have to be, you know, registered under APRA or something, you know, to have some type of accountability. We have to, you know, be really careful about this. Um, but there's a tension because, as you said, there's, a massive underground at the moment for people that you know their tradition the, the psychiatric treatment hasn't helped them and they've been suffering for 15 years so i'm gonna you know i'm gonna go out in the bush and do it with someone because maybe that will help me um and people are going to do that you know you can't stop that um and i wouldn't necessarily want to stop it it's their choice but i think that you know so the la you know the limited evidence i think has to be weighed against the um the need for harm minimization sort of um you know, like an injecting, we have injecting rooms, harm minimization. So, you know, the sooner we can start doing it as therapists and doctors and nurses, you know, I think it will reduce a lot of harm. But we do have to be really careful for things like sexual abuse. Um, but I would say that that actually happens in all types of therapies, which it does, unfortunately. But, you know, we just have to be as on top of it as we can. But people are, people are more vulnerable in psychedelic experiences, for sure. Ibogaine, um, yeah, I mean, Ibogaine has, you know, certain, Ibogaine is a psychedelic and um, it looks like it's going to be really helpful, particularly for opiate uh, detoxes and opiate dependence. And I think it will probably be a one really healthy thing um, for people to use and try. It has some cardiac risk factors, but yeah, I suspect it will be in, you know, 10 years, it will be used quite frequently. Timing of therapy in relation to withdrawal and rehabilitation when the participant has a substance dependency. Yeah, great question. I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I wouldn't say I have no idea. Um, you know, I mean, I think I think we always have this question. You know, I've heard people say, don't do therapy with people while they're using or in withdrawal. You know, I personally do do therapy with people um, where they're at. Um, but I you know, I suspect to have a psychedelic experience, we would expect people to at least be withdrawn. I personally initially would only do it with people that have been stable for months. You know, I think that would be a reasonable, uh, you know, even more potentially six to 12 months, I think would be nice, um, at least initially. But maybe one day, you know, when we know more about them, we'll be a bit more brave and we'll, you know, I don't think there's a contraindication for doing it for someone that's using um, at the moment, but I suspect initially it's going to be for people that are withdrawn from their substances. That one did already. Is there a risk for therapists and other clinicians of people preloading on psychedelics without the clinician's knowledge, consent? Preloading on psychedelics. I guess that means using too much, or I guess, sure, that's a risk. I guess, yeah. I would say yes, it's a risk. <laughs> that was one, that's yeah, the third one. If you're unpacking rapidly in a psychedelic assisted session, is there increased risk of suicide, self harm, increased risk of substance? So, all I can say is from the 
Um, now thousands of um, trial participants, there has not been an increased risk of suicide, self-harm or relapses. That's what the research is saying so far. It's still early days in research. As I said, there's no big pharma companies sponsoring these research, so it's going to take a long, it's going to take a while. Um, but so far, um, the evidence uh, clearly states that there are not increased risks. Um, but there are very intensive follow-ups. You know, after the, the day after, you know, sometimes the person will sleep uh, where they had the therapy, then they followed up the next day, then the next day. So there's very intensive management of human beings after the psychedelic experience um, because it can bring up, you know, trauma and abuse and things like that. So there needs to be a lot of support around the person. Any other questions in the room? A lot, lot of our patients will be um, neurobiologically challenged because they haven't, you know, haven't, haven't developed as much because of trauma as children, and we know how that affects the brain. So, how does that affect with a psychedelic? So, if you've got someone who is neurobiologically um, challenged because they're still in that kind of ego state because they haven't progressed because of um, lack of attachment and you using a substance like that, would it have detrimental effects because they wouldn't be processing it in the same way as maybe a regular adult who'd had? So I don't think anyone knows yet. Um, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a very complex question and to get answers to that question, I'm not sure how, it, you know, how we're gonna get answers to that question, but what I can say is in the studies that they've done for chronic, com, for chronic post-traumatic stress disorder with MDMA-assisted therapy, with, it didn't matter what your trauma was. You got better. So, so, they, so the phase three trial, just so very quickly, so the phase three trial that MAPS did in the States um, was on people with chronic post-traumatic stress disorder from all causes. So veterans, but also childhood sexual abuse. Um, these were people that on average had had PTSD for 14 years that had a range of treatments. They were treatment resistant. And after three sessions of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, 66% of them no longer fulfilled criteria for PTSD. Um, and it didn't matter whether that was from childhood sexual abuse, for example, or you were a veteran. So that's what we know so far. You're asking, I think, a much more complicated question, which I don't think anyone has the answer for at this point in time. Thank you, Ellie. That was terrific. Really appreciate that. Please join me in thanking Dr. Ellie Kotler. Thanks, everyone. Um, just a reflection on, I mean, Ellie's outside, but just a reflection on his uh, talk. I remember reading a book by uh, Gabor Mate, who's a big name in the trauma area. And just something he wrote in one of his books that remind that Ali's talk reminded me about. He said, when you're doing therapy with people that, you know, the therapist will say, well, how's your childhood? And I'll say, oh, it was fantastic. My parents are wonderful people. Um, and then they'll get into detail and they'll say, oh, my dad didn't talk to me from the years five till 15 and my mum would, uh, you know, withhold food if I didn't, you know, not feed me if I didn't do the dishes or something like that. Uh, so, yeah, I just found Ali's talk interesting in terms of that idea of, you know, childhood trauma being hidden but adult trauma being less hidden. Uh, anyway, my name's James Petty. I'm a project officer at VADA. Thanks for joining us uh, here today. Um, I'm here to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Philippin Naran. Uh, Dr. Philippin is a addiction medicine registrar at Western Health and a general practitioner. He co-chairs the Victorian AOD Committee of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, and he is a co-host of the Cracking Addiction podcast. Please welcome Dr. Philippin Naran. Thanks very much. Um, so, um, like James said, my name is Thalethan. I'm an addiction medicine registrar, and I'll be talking today about uh, Carmini Vidravan Ras, uh, which was something I was not really aware of close to a year ago. So, I thought it was an interesting topic to discuss. 
So before I start, I'd also like to do an acknowledgement of country and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So I thought I'd begin this presentation uh, with a few case studies, and these are patients that, that I've seen in my clinical practice. So the first patient is a 39-year-old Indian man who presented to the addiction medicine clinic, um, referred by his GP, with um, the, the only thing on the referral letter was uh, Carmony addiction. Um, and the first consultation was, was a phone consultation. So with regards to his substance use history, it is as listed on the slide, but I'll just go into a bit more detail. This gentleman had been using Carmony for the last uh, five years. Uh, it was initially prescribed to him in India by an Ayurvedic physician, and um, he was prescribed it for, to try and increase his energy um, and um, try and bring him more, more vitality. Um, he'd initially been prescribed uh, half to one tablet a day, but that usage soon increased. Uh, his maximal usage was seven tablets three times a day, and he had to take them three times a day. Um, he described significant withdrawal symptoms when he was not taking um, these medications. He described, instead of withdrawal symptoms as we would commonly describe them, he described tiredness. He said he would have no energy, he would yawn, he, he could not um, complete his activities of daily living. On further questioning, he described um, rhinorrhea, lacrimation, tremor, um, and um, the, the hair standing up on his forearms as well, which almost classic opioid withdrawal kind of symptoms. He had managed to wean down the tablets um, to, to seven tablets twice a day, but he felt he could go no further than this. He was sourcing these tablets through an Indian grocery store um, and it was over the counter at the Indian grocery store. So uh, readily able to, to pick it up. It was causing a lot of stress in his life. Um, he was attempting to work full time, but he was struggling to manage full time employment around using Carmony. It was causing stresses at home because the tablets were costing between $100 to $200 per bottle, and it was impacting his finances, and he was in a lot of conflict with his wife as a result of this. With regards to his other substance use history, he reports drinking half a bottle of whiskey one day per month uh, in a single sit sitting, no daily drinking, no withdrawal symptoms when he stops drinking alcohol, smoking uh, one to two cigarettes a day for the last 12 years, denied any other substance use and no history of injecting drug use, denied any real further input with addiction services, um, never been through withdrawal management or rehabilitation services, no AOD contacts at all, no legal history and no forensic history. His history otherwise was relatively unremarkable as well. He had no past psychiatric history, no mental history, no mental health history, no past medical history, wasn't taking regular medications, was in pretty good health, no allergies. He was a construction worker, still barely able to work full time, but struggling um, mainly due to his Carmony usage. And he was married and living with his wife in his own house. So the patient's goals were to, were to calm off Carmony. He was quite embarrassed. He was not able to stop using Carmony and he was cognizant of the increasing um, impacts Carmony was having on his life. Uh, he was unable to do the things he wanted and he was in a lot of conflict with his, with his wife, which was causing him a lot of distress. So we discussed some treatment options um, as to what we could potentially do with, with Carmony. I suggested potentially a slow wean of, of Carmony um, and we tried to talk about how that would look like or what that would look like. And we'll talk about how that was potentially a bit difficult later on in the presentation. He felt that this was impossible. He managed to come down from seven tablets three times a day to seven tablets um, twice a day, um, but felt he would not be able to wean any further than that due to the unbearable withdrawal symptoms. We talked about potentially admitting him to our residential withdrawal unit and um, symptomatically managing his withdrawal symptoms and even considering using buprenorphine as suboxone as a, as a short-term um, withdrawal management agent. Um, he didn't feel that he would be able to take the time off work and he didn't want to stop working. Um, so we also then discussed opioid substitution therapy, um, such as suboxone um, and consideration of a long-acting injectable buprenorphine option. And this was the option he, he preferred. So I probably should have said this earlier, but Carmony is, is an Ayurvedic medication which has been found to have opiates in it. He was unaware that it contained opiates when he was initially prescribed it. Um, and 
ultimately based on based on his history and the the goals that he wanted we decided to try uh, the suboxone and long-acting injectable buprenorphine option the issues that this raised was a bit more complicated than the standard um, opioid use disorder and management of opioid use disorder that I guess we'd say conventionally see in, in our addiction medicine clinic. The first question was, is this definitely an opioid use disorder? Well, you could say that he's definitely got withdrawal and tolerance to, to, to an opiate containing medication. He's had unsuccessful efforts to cut down and it's certainly having some negative impacts on his life. But I guess with withdrawal tolerance, you could argue this was prescribed by a physician, maybe not a physician in Australia, but a physician nevertheless. So if we can't use withdrawal tolerance guidelines, he'd still probably scrape through with two criteria for opioid use disorder. The other question was, when do you stop Carmony prior to commencing Suboxone? Um, and also marrying up to that is, what type of opiate exactly is in Carmony and what's the half-life? We're usually when we're talking about heroin or prescription opioids, we have a rough idea about duration of usage, I'm sorry, duration of, of length of symptoms and when to kind of advise patients to commence on buprenorphine so as to avoid a precipitated withdrawal. Here we're talking about medications with varied opiate content um, and we're not quite sure exactly what we're dealing with at, at this exactly. And also to further add complexity, what would an st appropriate starting dose of Suboxone look like for, for a medication such as this? This is, again, an unregulated medication bought over the counter in an Indian grocery store that does contain some level of opiate, but is four milligrams too much Suboxone to start with? Is two milligrams the most appropriate dose? Will we be under-treating him? Would we be over-treating him? So there are a couple of kind of complexities in, in the initial consultation in terms of what would be an appropriate treatment and how we would meet this patient's needs. So fortunately, he came back for a second appointment. Um, I'd organized a urine drug screen, which again confirmed that there were opiates in his urine. So um, I was pleased with that, that development. I broached the option of actually stopping Carmony a day before he presented to, to the clinic. And if he was presenting an opiate withdrawal, we could commence him on Suboxone. I felt that was potentially a safe option. Uh, the patient felt that this was impossible. He said he, the opiate cravings would be too much. Um, he would never be able to cope. And he, he was quite distressed talking about it. So we, we canceled that plan. The compromise we, we agreed on was taking two tablets of Carmony in the morning and then presenting to the pharmacy in the evening. Um, and if he was in withdrawal at that point in time to have a test dose of two milligrams of Suboxone. And he would then have a further test dose of two milligrams one or two hours later, and then we would up titrate as I guess we would conventional suboxone. The follow up was relatively unremarkable, actually. The transition to suboxone went well. He tolerated the test doses of suboxone. He's now stabilized on 12 milligrams of suboxone, and he's ceased using Carmony at, at that dose of suboxone. Case study two is a slight variation on, on this. So this was a 34-year-old Iranian man who was referred to our service for opioid substitution therapy. His substance use history is mainly, um, he started using opioids um, 13 years ago in his home country post a very severe motorbike accident and developed an, um, and post developing an, an opioid dependence was commenced on methadone in 2018 in Australia. Other substance use history includes um, um, a pack a day cigarette um, consumption, started smoking at the age of 16, previous um, alcohol use and previous benzodiazepine use, but none for a number of years and denied any other substance use history and no history of injecting drug use. So essentially um, this gentleman post his motorbike accident in Iran um, was put on um, morphine and then tramadol and then ultimately started self-increasing the amount of opiate he was taking and then reports he was taking up to a thousand milligrams of tramadol in in Iran um, at his peak usage he then subsequently emigrated to Australia um, was not taking opioids for a few months but then was commenced on prescribed panadine fort by his GP and then post escalating panadine fort usage was then put on escalating amounts of oxycontin and then his GP diagnosed him with an opioid use disorder and commenced him on methadone in 2018. Interestingly, um, he reports that his GP would write him two scripts for methadone, each of 80 milligrams, and they were sent to two different pharmacies. 
So his total daily dose was 160 milligrams of methadone. Unsurprisingly, his GP received a DHHS notification and then subsequently rapidly decreased the dose of methadone to the patient to 95 milligrams at a single pharmacy. Again, unsurprisingly, the patient went into opioid withdrawal uh, and was then sourcing 35 to 40 milligrams of non-prescribed methadone from a variety of sources and using 10 to 11 Carmony tablets to manage his other opioid withdrawal symptoms. So he came to our clinic, we took over his permit, we uptitrated his methadone. Um, he was stabilized on 220 milligrams of methadone and he stopped using Carmony as a, as a result of that. So those two cases, um, I guess, that show the different uses. One's kind of like the more classical presentation of Carmony dependence we see. This other one was Carmony being used as a substitute for opioid substitution therapy. So talking a bit about Carmony. So what is Carmony? Um, so Carmony or Carmony Vidron Ras is an opiate containing Ayurvedic herbal medication. Um, it comes in the form of tablets or pellets, which are usually swallowed whole. Um, the picture on the top is what Carmony tablets look like. And as you can see, they're, they're, they're balls and they're also handmade, <laughs> hand rolled. So there's in a tablet, in, in, in a bottle where there's about a hundred tablets, there's no uniformity in the dose of Carmony that you're getting. So each tablet varies quite significantly from, from the other. They're promoted for, as, for a wide variety of issues. So they, they range as a um, potential cure for impotence and erectile dysfunction, but also marketed for increasing energy and stamina. Readily available over the counter in India um, and are prescribed by traditional Ayurvedic practitioners. I should also mention they're also pretty readily available over the counter in Indian grocery stores in Australia still. So what is Ayurvedic medicine? So it's a, I guess, a natural system of medicine that's got um, many millennia of um, usage in India. So it's got a history that's over 3,000 years old. And it's kind of a holistic structure or system of medicine. So there's, um, it tries to kind of mend that mind, body, spirit um, amalgamation. So it encourages lifestyle interventions such as meditation, yoga, massage, as well as um, herbs. Um, also, it does encourage the ingestion of certain metals um, as well, which are thought to have healing properties. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, oil baths, as, as well as um, things like emesis or vomiting, as well as um, uh, a variety of other kind of, I guess, holistic um, interventions. It's a form of care in India that's quite well known. It's um, thought of as almost equal to conventional Western medicine in India. And it's got this kind of reputation that traditional Chinese medicine, naturopathic medicine and homeopathic medicine have. It is overseen in India by the Central Council of Indian Medicines. Um, and that's like the overarching body that governs Ayurveda in, in India. So what's in Karmani? So this is what's on the, um, this is what's on the bottle of a Karmani bottle. Um, I don't know if your Sanskrit is as bad as mine, but I don't understand most of the, most of the uh, ingredients there. But um, the, and, and, I pro, and I apologize for the pronunciation here, but the, uh, the Shudha Afifena, that's the Sanskrit term for Papava Somniferum. So that's the opium poppy. And that's where the, opi um, that's where the opiate content of Karmani comes from. So as we know, opium um, poppies contain a lot of opiate alkaloids, um, codeine, morphine, and essentially that's the ingredient that is responsible for Carmini's opiate content. Out of interest, um, Akara Kara um, is um, the Mount Atlas daisy. And in animal studies of rats, it's shown to increase testosterone levels. So that's theoretically where the um, aphrodisiac properties of uh, Carmini come from. Obviously, like this is not based on like, you know, rigorous peer reviewed analysis. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, um, but that's, that's that. So what are the doses of Carmony that are, that are advertised and, and what doses are people given? So the product information on Carmony um, recommends a daily dosage of half to one tablet per day. But as I mentioned, the pills are handmade and they vary in size. So, you know, one tablet is not the same as another tablet. 
Chemical analysis of the same tablets in the oh sorry of tablets in the same bottle show an opiate content variability of tenfold, ranging from two to twenty milligrams of opium. Chemical analysis of the tablets showed that in addition to the opiate alkaloids I've mentioned, such as co codeine, morphine, uh, papaverine, and noscapine, there's also traces of heavy metals such as lead, arsenic, and mercury, which comes back to the things I was saying about Ayurveda promoting metal uh, ingestion or certain metal ingestions as part of its healing philosophy. There have been numerous case reports of people having heavy metal toxicity post chronic ingestion of some Ayurvedic medications mm -hmm. and, the, and the health consequences associated with that. So with medications like Carmony, we do need to be aware of the opiate content and the risk of opioid use disorder, but we also need to be aware of the health impacts of these kinds of medications and in particular, you know, lead poisoning and heavy metal poisoning, because these are also, um, these can also lead to fatalities as well. This brings me to the interesting, um, I guess, cultural aspect of this and cultural views of medication. So most of the people I see in my addiction medicine clinic with opioid use disorder usually use opioids as a downer. It's for sedation and it's to try and kind of decrease anxiety or stress. In the Punjab, um, essentially the cultural view is that it's acceptable to use substances to kind of either alleviate your mood or increase your productivity. There's a culture of taking things to kind of get to a level of performance and that's acceptable. And opium in the Punjab has been present for many, many years. And there's reports of farmers taking opium before going out to till their fields. So before performing heavy labor, they take opium and then go out and do this heavy labor. So it, it kind of shows the cultural views of this medication. And we'll be going through some of the case reports and case series here, but it also kind of shows the fact that most of the people we will be discussing are men. Like, again, in my clinics, I usually see probably an even mix of male to females for opioid use disorder for heroin and prescription opioids. With Carmine, I've not seen a female for Carmine use. It's all been men and usually men from the subcontinent. So let's look at the literature and the literature is pretty limited. Um, so the literature is limited to case reports and case series. So the first documented report I could find was from 2010 and it was about a 35 year old man who became dependent on another Ayurvedic um, medication that contains opiate called Bashara, but then switched to using Carmony. He was treated with um, a combination of naltrexone, uh, psychoeducation, motivational enhancement and psychosocial rehabilitation. It's a pretty limited case report. I don't know, the case report does not mention if he made a sustained recovery, how long treatment lasted for, or what he, if there was any lapse or relapse post um, treatment. There was a case series from New Zealand of 10 men from um, a time period from 2013 through to 2020. Um, these men were using um, either Carmony or Bashara, uh, the, the um, Ayurvedic containing opiate medication I mentioned earlier. All the patients were treated with opioid substitution therapy. And at the time that this case series was published around 2020, um, nine out of 10 of the men remained in treatment and seven out of 10 were abstinent from Carmony or Bashara. And um, I don't know about you, but those numbers are pretty impressive. It, although, although it's a small set, um, keeping a 90% 90, 90 of people retained in treatment over, seven, over up to a seven year period and 70% abstinent of Carmony was quite good. So what's the Australian experience? These were the first case reports that came uh, to Australia. Um, again, based about on two patients in the first case um, report and uh, one patient in the second case report. Both were treated with various forms of opioid substitution therapy, including a long-acting injectable buprenorphine with um, varying success rates as well. This case series from Queensland um, came out probably about a month or two before our case series came out. And it was about 12 people that were, that were treated in Queensland over a time period. Um, 11 out of the 12 um, men in this um, case series came from the Indian subcontinent. Six were treated with Suboxone, um, three were treated with long-acting injectable buprenorphine, and two who had a very short course of um, usage of Carmony were actually, and no other substance use history, were actually treated with Norseband patches, which were subsequently weaned and they were discharged with nothing. 
which brings me to like the definitive and gold standard work in in this piece in this in this area, which is like our case report. That was that was a bad attempt at a joke, but anyway. Um, so this is our experience here at Western Health um, with with Carmony. So we we um, published this in Drug and Alcohol Review, and this is twelve patients we saw in our clinic over about a seven year period. Um, so 10 um, out of the 12 came to us for essentially Carmody dependence. Case number 11 was the second case I presented earlier today. And case number 12 was a gentleman who reported a three to four year history of Carmody dependence in India. Um, emigrated to Australia, was abstinent of opioids, but then started using heroin and came to us for heroin use disorder, which we treated with um, opioid substitution therapy. Um, as you can see um, in, in, this, in this slide, um, we've, we've managed to maintain 10 out of 12 in treatment. So we've only had two patients drop out of treatment. And in, in this group of patients, 11 out of the 12 um, of, of these patients were from North India, and in particular, the Punjab region of India. Out of the patients that we've maintained in treatment, nine out of 10 have actually returned to full-time employment. So we've managed to keep 10 out of 12 patients in treatment over a seven year time period. And um, nine have kind of been able to return to most of their activities of daily living. And this marries up pretty well to the previous case um, report that we talked, um, the case series that we talked about from Queensland as well. So what it does seem to show is that these patients who are dependent on Carmony seem to respond really well to opioid substitution therapy seem to remain engaged in treatment and seem to have relatively good and sustained recovery. So there seems to be a very good recovery capital for, for these men once they get to treatment and they seem to remain in treatment for a long time period, which is positive. The question though is, what is the role of opioid substitution therapy in, in this group of patients? So I've just said how well these, these men seem to be doing an opioid substitution therapy. And the current treatment for Carmony Vidriven Russ, and as an opioid, given the fact that we're considering it an opioid use disorder, is to, is to continue people on opioid substitution therapy. But the evidence for opioid substitution therapy is mainly based around the harms and risks associated with heroin or high dose prescription opioids as well. There's no evidence that Carmony Vidriven Russ leads to significantly increased risks of mortality. There's no large scale studies that show a lot of people are dying of Carmony Vidriven Russ overdoses. And there's, to the best of my knowledge, no one has died of Carmony Vidron Ras overdose in Australia. So the risk benefit profile is, is a bit different. So is this the most appropriate treatment in this group of people that we're seeing? So what is the legality um, around Carmony and what, are, what is its status here in Australia? So in 2016, Carmony was made a prohibited import. And any supply of Carmony in Australia is illegal. And Australian Border Force and the TGA are working to further prevent any importation of Carmony into Australia and will seize or destroy any medications or sorry, any Carmony that's impounded here. So it's, it's not sanctioned, it's not approved, and it's illegal. However, still really available, um, readily available in, in Indian grocery stores. So most of the patients that I've, I talk to say they could still get Carmony if they wanted to. Um, it's not behind a shelf. It's, um, uh, it's, it's just governed by the Indian grocery store owner. Uh, and now because of its readily, readily availability and it has had increasing um, mentioning in the media, there's concerned people from other ethnic groups are now aware of Carmony and are now trying to source Carmony as a readily or easily um, uh, accessible form of opioids as well, given its ease of access. So I guess in summary, what was I trying to accomplish with this talk? It's just probably to kind of increase the knowledge of Carmony and, and the fact that it's out there and it's, a, it's there. It's present in the community and its use is possibly underreported. I was talking to a psychiatrist in the Western suburbs um, and, and she was saying that she'd seen a lot of rideshare drivers um, dependent on Carmony and some even using Carmony before going out on a shift as well, which is quite scary if you think about people taking opioids before driving other people around town. Um, 
easily available through some traditional Indian stores um, through which, uh, and there, though there is some increased difficulty sourcing tablets. And I guess this is one of the bigger problems. We have this opiate containing medication um, that's essentially on the shelf um, being dispensed by a, an untrained um, person. In Australia in general, we're trying to monitor prescription opioids. We've got real-time prescription monitoring. We're putting education programs out there for prescribers and our patients. Yet there's this whole market of opioids that are escaping the net and that people are not aware of. And I think the scope of the problem is potentially underreported and we may just be not even cresting the wave in terms of how many people are potentially using this as well. And the harms available are there, not only with the opiate content, but also the heavy metal content in these medications as well. Um, there's limited evidence and literature on the treatment options, um, though patients in our case series and case reports seem to respond well to opioid substitution therapy. Um, there's limited evidence again with regards to treatment, but patients seem to respond well and remain engaged with outpatient treatment, and they seem to have good recovery capital as well and seem to be quite motivated to remain in treatment. Um, so yes, this, this in summary, there are Carmeny Vidran Rasas out there. There are significant harms associated with Carmeny Vidran Ras, and it's important for us to be aware and, and consider people who are using this. And I guess it's incumbent on us to direct these patients in, in the right pathways. So um, thanks for your time. That's cool. Thanks, Dylan. And that was really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to use my chair's prerogative and ask, well, not really a question, but a couple of observations uh, that I'd like to hear your thoughts on. One was that, um, oh, sorry, and please send through your questions to Mentimeter or just stick your hand up if you have one. Um, all those 12 patients that you saw seem to be within a kind of late 20s to early 40s yep. age group. Uh, and then my other observational question was that you know, I remember when codeine was rescheduled and certainly VADA and other groups were really concerned about the impact of that in terms of cutting people off suddenly. So thinking about that regulatory effort by the TGA and Border Force and everything, just be interested to hear your reflections on the risks of that if, you know, suddenly we can effectively regulate Carmony and, and what that means for people who are using it. I think it might be similar to the, the Panadine Fort scenario where I think all of us were thinking there'd be this influx of people coming to general practices or addiction medicine outpatient clinics who were opiate dependent on Panadine Fort. And, and I never saw it when I was doing general practice and we really didn't see that wave. I don't know if it's going to be similar to that or not. Um, it is still an illegal import. So it, the 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 upregulation, if you will, is, is already out there since 2016. It's been an illegal import. Um, but as with anything, we know where there's a will, there's a way, and um, it's still finding its way here in Australia. So I don't imagine we'll see a massive upsurge unless there's, like, I guess, greater efficacy in the in the um, in the in the um, importation per se, or more success in in um, getting those supplies of Carmony. So I can't imagine a massive uptick per se in terms of people seeking treatment, um, unless their Carmony use is causing more problems. Uh, is Carmine known to be diverted for intravenous use? And are there any report? No, for both questions for that. It's um, swallowed. Um, and all of the patients have, uh, that we saw said that they swallowed it. There was not even, no one mentioned even crushing or, or insufflating it. Um, and there's been no evidence of opiate overdose sec um, secondary Carmine that I'm aware of, particularly in Australia. Depends on, uh, so with regards to the cost, um, I've heard numbers of between 100 to $200 per bottle. Oh. Thank you, Philippe. And can I ask about uh, Ayurvedic medications uh, more broadly, presumably if and as this is uh, sort of shut down or closes down, that there are other medications containing other psychoactive substances, which if they're not already on the shelves may emerge. Are you aware of any others?
Uh, not off the top of my head. I, 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 must, conv I, con uh, I must confess, I'm not like a, a massive Ayurvedic medicine expert. There are a lot of opiate containing Ayurvedic medications such as Bashara in addition to Kami mm -hmm. as well. And I guess with regards to the other adulterants in some of those Ayurvedic medications, particularly heavy metals, um, it is a real, I don't want to say common, but it is not unheard of for metals to be mixed in with other um, compounds as well as part of that philosophy as well. So yes, there could be other adulterants in addition to opiates being in there. Um, could it become an evolving problem over time? Possibly, but I wouldn't be able to say that with like any great confidence per se. Uh, did you consider supplicate? Um, maybe. Uh, <laughs> look at who the sponsor is. Uh, uh, with opioid substitution therapy, we usually leave it up to we usually leave it up to the patients. Um, uh, so yeah, supplicate would certainly be in the conversation as with um, any of the other long acting injectable buprenorphine options. So yes, was the answer. Are there any others, Julia? Not right now. Um, I have a question. Uh, just be interested in your personal reflections on um, how the patients felt or responded sort of emotionally uh, to their successful treatment, um, whether they shared with you any reflections around harmony or their surprise at finding out that it was opioid containing, you know, um, yeah, a bit of insight into their personal experience would be great. It was a bit of a mixed bag in terms of um, how the patients reacted. Some were shocked that it contained opiates um, and um, were, were quite embarrassed at having to come to an addiction medicine outpatient clinic to, to get treatment. Uh, some were aware that it contained opiates and were um, happy to seek treatment. Uh, most patients were pretty easy to engage with. Um, there was no real issues per se um, with, with regards to that. Some patients could not believe that they could be addicted to anything because it had been prescribed to them by a doctor in India or an Ayurvedic doctor in India as well. So it was kind of dealing with the patient's expectations or the views of the medication, the fact that it was readily acceptable in India. And I guess it's that cultural issue as well. This is kind of an acceptable medication in India for you know decreased energy, stamina as an aphrodisiac and then to be told that hang on this is a uh, illegal import here in this country uh, and you have an opioid use disorder uh, it, it's a pretty big it's a pretty big gulf to kind of jump from from accepted substance use to completely non not accepted substance use and you have to accept this alternate medication which is a sublingual film or a, a depot preparation and you have to come to see us or go to the pharmacy on these kind of restrictive kind of terms as well so from being in charge of their medications and sourcing it from a grocery store and managing the dose themselves to getting into a tightly regulated treatment regimen was somewhat of a culture shock for some patients. But most, I guess, and it's evidenced by the treatment retention, uh, once that was gulfed, um, most patients engaged well with treatment and seemed to have affected a, a pretty meaningful recovery. Are there any other questions? Uh, how were your patients referred for treatment, GP? Um, some were GP, some were word of mouth. So people who use Kamini usually know other people who use Kamini and we'll, we'll tell them about our service. Uh, so word of mouth. But yeah, so a couple of GPs and probably about 50-50 split, I'd, I'd probably say. Not so much self-referred, um, but yeah, it's probably word of mouth or GP. Thank you. Um, I, I sort of had two questions and you, you kind of covered the first one. So why did they start? Um, and was there any mental health issues with the patients? Did they have any sort of history or background or trauma? Um, and the second question, I noticed that everybody's um, treatment length is all different. So you've got some that have been on for two months, um, others have been 80, 90 months. So is the idea that they're going to get off the treatment eventually or is it something that they're going to stay on long term? Like, how do you decide that as well? Thanks. Um, I'll start with the treatment length question first. Um, that variability kind of depends on, on the patients and essentially 
we did an audit through our files. So we went back in time to kind of review who, who had come in seeking treatment for Carmony and their treatment progress going forward. With regards to how long people are on treatment, it's, as, as we all know, it's a piece of stream kind of question, depending on, depending on what the patient's goals are and what they want. Most patients were happy to be on some form of opioid substitution therapy and continue on with that opioid substitution therapy, um, I guess, indefinitely. Uh, and maybe that's part of that uh, impression that this is another medication that I can use to regulate whatever I was trying to regulate before. Um, admittedly, we're trying to manage um, opioid use disorder and manage uh, withdrawal symptoms per se, but maybe there's that element of taking a, a substance to regulate mood. Why were people using Carmony initially? Um, pretty much all of the, the, the men that I saw were saying that they were using it to increase their energy or stamina admitted that it was for aphrodisiac purposes, uh, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, so yeah, it was always for energy and stamina. Um, and uh, that was the indication there. Sorry, you, do you have a third question? Yes. No? Yeah. But yeah, it, it's kind of interesting as well, because <coughs> when you also talk to these gentlemen about their symptoms or, or why they're coming to see you, it's always, they say they feel tired, which is why they're here. So it, it's kind of like, I use it for energy and stamina and I'm here because I feel tired instead of opioid withdrawal symptoms that we would classically say. Oh, no significant um, trauma history, apart from um, the, the, the one patient in that case series that kind of had a, a decent trauma history was that Iranian gentleman we, we talked about. The others denied any significant <laughs> mental health history and even with prodding and follow up and we've seen these gentlemen for quite a while. A lot of them have denied any significant trauma history per se, or or mental health history. All right. Uh, any other questions just before we break for lunch? All right. Well, uh, yeah. It's oh, here we go. In discussing community addiction, is there any cultural consideration like? When can we say that person has dependence on Khomeini? Uh, I think it's like with anything, uh, it's all about history taking and um, determining what role the Khomeini is playing in, in the person's lives. So I guess with cultural considerations, yeah, as I mentioned on the, on the previous slides, this is an Ayurvedic medication in, in India um, and in certain parts of India, there is an association between taking some substances such as opium or Khomeini before doing certain activities or that um, Khomeini will um, serve a purpose in improving your mood or energy or stamina. With regards to dependency, I'd, I'd say it's the same kind of basic themes as we would use to diagnose any kind of dependency as per DSM-5, basically. So if you can, if you feel you can satisfy that, get a decent substance use history, um, then I think you can proceed with treatment based, based on that. I was just wondering what the usual frequency of use is with people. Like, so I suppose it sort of makes me think about the duration of action and that sort of stuff. Really varies. And it's probably because those tablets are so variable in content as well. So I've seen people use TDS to QID. I've seen a couple of people use like once daily, but like a larger quantity of Carmini tablets as well. So I've seen... I think in case one, I mentioned he was using seven tablets, TDS. I've also seen people use 14 tablets in one sitting as well. Um, so it, it, unfortunately, the frequency of use is not always as helpful in Carmony as it would be with, say, other um, opioids, for example, where we're kind of dealing with a bit more of a fixed dose medication. All right. Can everyone join me in thanking Dr. Philip and Nara? Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for those joining us online. We hope you're enjoying the program so far. This is our third keynote for the day, exploring a reduction in needle and syringe program, NSP, use in the context of the introduction of a nurse practitioner-led long-acting injectable buprenorphine program. It is a long title. It's a 
yeah, it's a good title. And we have also two outstanding speakers. And if you don't know Terry and Adam, I don't know where you've been. <laughs> Terry is a nurse practitioner specialising in AOD, mental health and intellectual disability with postgrad qualifications in pathophysiology, medicine, teaching and assessing clinical practice. Terry has worked in Australia, the UK and New Zealand, including as a ward manager in a forensic hospital, a clinical lead in a detox and an opioid substitution clinic, as well as advisory roles, including with the UK Youth Justice Board. In 2012, Terry left the UK to spend a year in New Zealand, working as a coexisting disorder nurse before moving to Gippsland in 2014. Terry helped establish the Pharmacotherapy and Wellbeing Clinic at Sale Hospital to provide outpatient consultations and opioid replacement therapy for those unable to be managed in the primary care setting. Terry is joined by Adam Siebe, Dr. Adam Siebe, in fact who has worked clinically in mental health and AOD settings and is currently a research fellow at Deakin University in Melbourne. And Adam is the current president of the Drug and Alcohol Nurses of Australia, Dana, who are supporting this event alongside VADA and Indivior. I'll hand over to Adam and Terry. Thanks for joining us. As you can tell by that bio, I'm pretty old. Um... <laughs> Yes, so um, I'd like to, uh, to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where we gather today and pay my respects to the elders past and present. And before I start, I will have to apologise for my subclinical ADHD, which I tend to walk up and down a lot deal with my adrenaline. Really. Okay. Good job. Clicker. So I'd like to tell you about a very exciting journey we've been on at, uh, at Central Gippsland Health um, and look at some things that came up along the way after we established a pharmacotherapy clinic. So initially I was working in the hospital, I still work in the hospital as an alcohol and drug nurse, seeing, uh, yeah, sorry, don't have it. Yeah, yeah, with, uh, with the inpatients and ED and everywhere else, but it's only a tiny hospital. Um, and I realised that there was a need for people in the community. So we're getting lots of people turning up in ED in all states of withdrawal. Um, um, ED were finding it really hard to cope with. Um, I was seeing people in hospital who then went to the community and weren't adequately supported in the community. And it's not, it, it, and it's not a, um, it, it's not, around the alcohol and drug nurses in the community because they're absolutely amazing, but there seemed to be something lacking. And what I was seeing was a lot of people with a lot of unaddressed medical conditions, a lot of unaddressed psychiatric conditions. And this is why we decided to um, start the pharmacotherapy and wellbeing clinic, which is nurse led. This one? On one? I think we start, we just kind of said that really. So one of, one of the services we did provide was um, uh, long acting injectable buprenorphine. Oh, sorry, I know, <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna put it on here. Yeah, so one of the things we started to actually explore using um, long acting injectables. So, what we found out when we started our, our program was we started to see a shift on the change of dispensing in needles across. Uh, across. Okay. Uh, we started to see a decrease. So, incidentally, we noticed with, with, the, uh, with the COVID payments, you remember the people got extra COVID payments? Actually, the needles went up. So we knew this, what, whatever was, there were drugs out on the street. So we knew that. But what we started to see with um, the introduction of long acting injectables, the needles starting to decline. And we're going, oh, we didn't know that this was happening. And can you see? We're looking right the way from 5010, we're looking at here, 2250. So we thought, what the, what's going on here? 
And, you know, we weren't thinking of putting that together. It's just that we count the needles every month and always keep a record because you have to do that for the Department of Health. And, yeah, we're thinking what's going on here. So we really don't know. We really don't know how many injectors there are out there. However, we were starting to see to see a decline with the introduction of the long act, uh, the, the pharmacotherapy done in, um, sorry about this. Uh, so, uh, we started to see a decline um, with the introduction of the clinic. So as we said, during COVID-19, it became a social and health concern, but from early 2020, it did not reduce the number of needles dispensed. And there was always, there was kind of a lot of talk and noise around the fact that access to drugs had gone down, but it wasn't happening with us. In fact, the number of dispensed needles increased with significant increases in the two months when COVID assistance payments were made by the federal government, which is interesting. Cool. Yes, so we started um, commencing in mid 2020 and, and actually it took time for uh, people to come along. Um, we, what we done was we put like in our needle machines, we put uh, little flyers to say, if you're interested in LAIB, rock up. And I had this young man who came to see me, I'll call him Mark. And he went, oh, he said, I've heard about this um, new injecting injection bring it on and he'd been a gentleman who had been addicted from when he was 16 he was now 45 and he was going to come and try it was quite a larrikin and a bit of a bit of a name around town so anyway he goes along he has his injection and he thinks it's all a bit of a joke then he calls me and he went terry aren't you he said i just woke up and i'm not thinking do i go to the chemist or do i score is that all right <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. He went. So then he rang up a couple of days later and he said to me, Terry, he said, I'm waking up and not thinking about thinking about go, do I score or go to the. So then he calls me again and he says to me, do you know what? I put it to the test. I made my mates cook up in front of me and I didn't want it, which was amazing. So with the endorsement of our man around town, we start to see more and more people come forward to go on to the <laughs> injection. Not only did they not, they started to see a lot of stability in their lives. We started to see, got to see a lot of health improvements. Because if you think about it, you know, what do you, what do you end up in a pharmacotherapy clinic doing? Most of the time, arguing about takeaways. Well, I'm going, I'm going fishing for a month, Terry. I said, no, you're not, because you're not going to go fishing. You don't, you don't even get out of your bed in the morning. Oh, yeah, you know, so all those kind of things. So now they had the ease of injection. They didn't have the stigmatization of the chemist. And they had more money in their pocket. And within their half an hour consultation, I was starting to address their mental health needs and their physical health needs that the GPs were with all due respect, were actually neglecting because all they want to do is get people in and out of their doors within 10 minutes. So it was good. Um, so we would said about this, haven't we, the COVID-induced highs. Um, so average number of needles dispensed between October and December 2021, which was 2042, which is nearly a 50% reduction in needles. And at that time, we had about average of 20, pa uh, 20 patients on long-acting injectable. Um, can we go to the next one? So, as I said, it, people, it steadily increased. Um, high percentage of vulnerable and previously inconsistent patients opting to attend consultations and receive the LIB treatment. We weren't seeing any, any presentations in ED for overdose, which was amazing, because we've got all the main players on it. And one of the, one, one of the um, ladies said to me, oh, you know, or even the drug dealers have gone out of town because they haven't got a market, which has been brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, so regular, um, so we basically started to create some normality in patients' day-to-day -day life. And I'll go on and tell you about some of the amazing things the ladies and gentlemen I work with have done since they've been on the injection. Okay. 
So by the end of 21, as I said, more than 20, 20 patients were being treated. And I said, so although it's impossible to determine the accuracy of how many people inject, you know, some people say two, sometimes six, and there's eight. If we assume 20 people were injecting three times a day, then in total, it would be 1,800 needles a month, okay? The figure is consistent with the observed reduction in dispensed needles between July and December 2021. Um, so we, we correlated, so we, Adam, we thought about what other factors? Yeah, yeah. I'll talk to it now if you like. Yeah, come on. Uh, I think the next slide, look at the next one. Oh. So to determine whether this was actually just something that was happening, because we all know drug markets are odd beasts at times, and we all went through the pandemic, right, where everything changed, our borders got shut down, and all our patients and clients started using weird and wonderful things, or as Terry said, using lots of stuff when they got that juicy government money. I think we all saw the Herald Sun front cover of the guy coming out of Dan Murphy with the 12 slabs of VB going, this is the best day of my life, you know? <laughs> They're a, they're a strange beast, drug markets, and we've seen lots of research about what has happened since then. But we actually did a, some correlation analysis around the dispensing of needles and syringes from the vending machine um, and found a pretty strong correlation between the number of people who were started by Terry on the long-acting injectable and a reduction in needles dispensed. So you can look at this and say, yeah, good one. You know, maybe the the heroin dealer moved from sale to came back into Melbourne because you know the market was more lucrative there. So we're in the process of writing this up as a as a research paper and looking at some of the confounding factors. But it looks like everything else has remained stable. So we've looked at ambulance callouts for overdose, which have remained steady through this time. We've looked at as a secondary site, which is actually a pharmacy. It's a needle and syringe program there, which looks like they charge for needle and syringe. So I don't know how they're getting any sales, but they kind of sit around, you know, 90 to 100 yeah. per year and they've remained fairly stable. So by the look of it, the, the main variable here is people being inducted on the long-acting injectable buprenorphine. Uh, I think we've got a graph after this one. Yeah. So it said 90 less, less needles per month per person. So it worked out uh, as 90 um, needles um, less per month per person on the program. That, that's amazing. Agreed. And I think, look, I'm going to get on my soapbox here because there's lots of people, hi, interviewer, <laughs> welcome to the party. There's lots of people giving this medication and we know that it works for lots of people, but I genuinely think there's a lot of people out there, and I'm not going to name specific professions, that are just giving this injection, taking money and going see in a month. And I think this is this is actually how we've structured this paper is around Terry's model, which is really wraparound care. So Terry will talk more to this later, but it's not just giving a long-acting injectable buprenorphine, but providing a lot of psychosocial support, things that were missing, you know, I'm going to have to name names, aren't I? Like people going to the pharmacist and getting their injection once a month, coming back in 28 days, you know, they're missing out on a lot of this stuff unless they're well connected. And I think this is a real strength of this model, the, the well, this clinic that Terry started. So it does look like this correlation is actually in response to people being started on long acting injectable. So there's a couple of next steps for us now. One is to, of course, money talks, right? I can say everything I want about how good this is, but it all comes down to money. So uh, the next stage will be to do some cost benefit analysis around these kind of nurse led models. I think there's huge value in these models, not just nurse practitioners, but nurse led models as well. Here we're looking at a nurse practitioner led model. So prescribing, you know, right through to monitoring, but of course all nurses are able to give this injection and provide that wraparound type care. And of course, then we need to talk to people who are getting this medication. Terry's giving us some anecdotal examples of people who are saying this has changed my life. So they're our next two steps. And we should probably declare now that Indivior have been very supportive of this, this research work by funding some of the statistical analysis at this point. So thank you, <laughs> because it's uh, quite expensive and neither of us are statisticians, but the numbers are, are looking very good. Oh, sorry. 
So this is what more or less what you've said. So we, even when we factored in, because we did factor other people in who were in a, who were on the injection for pain. So even if we factor them in, it was seventy three point three percent less fewer needles. And there we go again. So that's another correlation. So let's talk about the positive outcomes for the community. So with, with having the clinic, the access to the LAOB, the access to half an hour appointments, we are actually addressing people's healthcare needs. They're getting full medical workups, they're getting their medications. Most of all, they're getting listened to. And, you know, people talk about their trauma. People, you know, people come along and said, I've got borderline personality terror. And I went, I don't like that word. You probably have a lot of trauma, haven't you? We talk about the trauma. We talk about the trauma and how that has affected their neurological dark um, development. And then we can, and then people start to, the light goes on. Well, I'm not actually a bad person. Oh yeah, that makes sense. We use, <laughs> use one of my brain models. They love that. And we talk about those kind of things. And my, where I come from personally is, is about empowerment for people you know not doing let them understand why they act in the way they do or they respond to things in the way they do why they use drugs and one of the good things i guess from the long acting injectables is that it hits that mu receptor and we know that mu receptor is craving to be stimulated because half of these people have never had adequate parent parenting or trauma or emotionally absent parents and yes you, we know the brain covertly looks for the stimulation of the mood receptor so the brain can move on in development which is when you talk to a patient they say oh it's like a big warm hug yeah that's the one you should have from your mum so we we talk about that and, and, and just normalize it and just say you know you're in this position not because you have behavioral problems or you're a borderline personality which i hate you're here because and you, you're coping the best you can with your with all your emotions and all your trauma because of your neurobiological development. And we can do something about that. And I have to agree with our previous speaker who talks about CBT and DBT. And I think well, I would never do that with my patients, mainly because if I'm most of them have really problems with mood modulation and temporal lobe damage. So we just, it's about getting to know them, what's their dog's name, what their aspirations are, and, and just uh, looking at the health, be interested, you know. I had a lady, she'd been, she came to see me, she, um, uh, she was just literally flipped end on by her GP, and I, I, I really don't like to say that, but she was. She came to see me, and she said, oh, they keep giving me the end on, but they, uh, my earache doesn't go away. Well, I think I said, I think you've got triangular myalgia. She went, oh, I said, let's stop the endo and get you off that. And I gave her um, an anti-epileptic, which, which you can give for that. She said, my, my earache's gone, Terry. But she had been flicked off by a GP because her GP thought she kept saying she had the earache because she's trying to get more endo. And it wasn't the case. And um, I've had um, pregnant women and um, who've uh, had really good births, who got stabilized in treatment, doing really, really well. So I kind of do it, I work with the obstetricians around the mountain And I think the most sad thing I ever hear is that, that, that um, people when they're uh, pregnant, the ladies say to me, we're not, we don't come to treatment because we're scared of our babies being taken away. We don't come to treatment because we're treated appallingly. We're treated like we're, nothing and I actually went into an appointment with a with a lady and the obstetrician sat there didn't give her eye contact and said oh this isn't a good situation is it you know so there wasn't the congratulations if you want to get someone into care you've got to value them and you know I say things like oh you want to keep the baby right we'll work at it you know but, um we'll do the best we can and these are the goals we need to achieve and it's just breaking a lot of that stigma with the health system and just saying that these people actually do get sick you know it's not that they're always seeking drugs so there's been i've supported a 
couple of women through pregnancies. I've had I've had ladies get their children back because they've been on the long acting injectable, which has been amazing. I had one um, chap, he's really nice. He's got a bit of cognitive disability, uh, disability. He came to see me and he went, Terry, this is the first time I've been out of prison for more than three months. And he, he's been out of prison for two years now, comes to see me. And he comes and talks about all his issues and bits and pieces that's going on in his life and his relationship issues because he gets taken advantage of quite a lot. But he, it, it, it's just nice to see he's being valued. And I must say, I, I get really humbled when people say to me, and this has been said to me on more than one occasion, you are the first person that's ever listened to me. You know, and that's that's re that actually really makes me want to cry. And I think in the healthcare system, and they talk about people not living as long and as twenty years deficit. Why? Why? Because you know, no, the health system doesn't have time for them. I had a young woman come to see me, and she'd been on ice for quite some time, maybe eight years. And um, she'd been coming into ED, and she was in drug-induced psychosis. And they'd ship her off to the acute unit. They flick her out of the door two days later. So she came to see me and I said, she said, I want to get my little girl back. And I said, yeah, fine, we'll work on that. So we've done a lot of diarying thing. And I said, you know what? I'm wondering if it is drug-related psychosis. When you tell me about the age, when you start to start that, that started, that might not be that. So we actually worked with her. We stopped her eye shoes and we found out she had underlying schizophrenia. And we treated the schizophrenia. She actually is working as a, as a, a, in a kindergarten now. She's got my children back. She's got her own house. And it's, it's been amazing because we're not actually dealing with people. We're just kind of, oh, well, anyway. But as nurses, we have the room to, to do that, to actually treat people holistically. And I think that the money we save through pub, public health you know, and the money we save for health outcomes, uh, ED presentations, all those kind of things could actually be funneled into actually giving people a better, better, better health service. It's, you know, like it, it just makes me cross anyway. But certainly. So, um, so as we say, um, reduced opioid use. Um, we haven't had any... Uh, Anecdotally, they, uh, the, the ED ward manager, uh, ED manager said to me, oh, I haven't seen an overdose in a couple of years now. Um, obviously, they said improved health, health outcomes, um, reduction in post-recovery relapse. So when people actually come and they've done the withdrawal, they, get, they actually get followed up in clinic, which is really good. Um, family be re reunited. We know that if we can get some person's one person stabilized some some um, people well it actually has a great knock-on effect not only for community personal relationships but certainly through costs in the um, custodial system um yep so and reduction in drug related death prison release so i often see the people who come out of prison give them their injections as well um, and as i said the bloodborne virus thing really good and um, we have we don't have many needles lying around anymore um and increase yeah um so what, what i am still doing battling with doctors trying to get them to kind of see um my patients and ladies and gentlemen in a completely different light but that's always going to be a battle and that will be going on forever um yeah i can go to the next one thank you so here's a few things that some of my patients have said um, no cravings. I don't have any cravings anymore since I've been on the treatment. No missions. Um, so you know about the mission. That's probably just as um, exciting as the score, really, isn't it? It's a bit like um, four pay before sex. Um, life changing. Um, I've never had energy. I feel so good. And I've had at least 12 people say, this clinic has changed my life which is really, really powerful. And um, I no longer have to go to the pharmacy and feel stigmatized. I can leave my past behind me and move forward. I've had, oh, I had a, a gentleman and a lady and they were really caught up in, in, in the opioid world and to the point where he had to sell her for sex to feed the habit. 
they have now moved away from the area. They're both in employment since they've been on the injection. It's amazing. And um, first time I've had savings. And then the other thing, I don't feel I'm on in treatment at all. I'm, I'm not sedated. I feel that feel that I'm I can do things and work and enjoy my life. And I can be a mum. Oh, the amazing amounts of uh, mum uh, mums that had children return to them, and I still are. Uh, I still get the thing from um, child protection. Well, they can still use on top, but um, though I think it would take a lot of fentanyl to do that, wouldn't it? They'd have to be millionaires. Um, and as a young Adam, first time I've been out of prison for over three years, and and what Mark said here, people can cook in front of me, and I feel no urge. Or craving to use so it's all wrapped around in that whole package of holistic care of being able to not even just help people navigate the healthcare system you know they've gone to the doctors and the doctor won't refer them to specialists so I could pick the phone up and we just talk about that and just see what we can do and found a lot of people with very nasty underlying pathology that hasn't been addressed so yeah I think that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, do you, want do you want me to wrap up? Yes, please. Oh, we're going, we're getting booted. It's playoff music like the... Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> I just wanted to wrap up and say that they're pretty interesting numbers and we've kind of been given this tool that does some pretty good stuff for lots of patients. But again, I just wanted to reiterate that Terry's model and nurse-led models seem to be the way of the future with uh, the long-acting injectable. I mean, we are the holistic care providers, right? Everyone says that they are, but we actually are. We look after mental health, physical health, psychosocial issues, as Terry's just indicated. Um, so again, we're hoping to add some more data to this and really showcase that nurses are the way to administer this. and and trade under this model. So thanks for listening. Plenty of time for questions. There are plenty of time for questions. And we have one online. Are any of your patients receiving on Bouvidal or is it supplicate only? Hang on, Terry. <laughs> as, as I said, they do have the choice, but usually because most of my patients have been people have been on heroin for quite some time who have a mega mega tolerance and they're usually um uh, fast metabolizers to uh, um to opioids so supplicate is the one that holds them so the majority of my patients well all of them actually are on supplicate Thanks, Terry. Any other questions? Yep, let me come down to you, Michelle. No, you'll need the microphone. We can't have you talk otherwise. <laughs> we could hear you normally, yeah. <laughs> um, I would just like to add, I've got a different nurse practitioner model and don't think because you don't have a drug safe on site that you cannot administer these long-acting injectables. I use a few community pharmacies, and I think that's further destigmatizing for the clients as well, because I've probably got permits for, oh, I've got probably about 50 people on between Sublocade and Bouvidel. They've got the choice. I prefer, because of the outcomes, Sublocade, because it lasts more than 28 days. The Bouvidels lasted about 21 to 23. Um, and I use community pharmacies and it was my lifesaver when I had to go overseas or if you're a sole practitioner and you need to go on leave um, and you don't have the luxury of having a nurse who can administer them um, it stops all the storage issues everything like that and all you have to do is train up your, your community pharmacist and I've been doing that for since Sublocade and Bouvidel was launched on the market. And my clients absolutely love it because they go in and the pharmacist gives an appointment just like anybody else can in for any other vaccine. And exactly all the, all the same feedback. 
you know, it breaks the chains. They can go in. The pharmacies are opened a lot longer than our clinics. And the other good thing is my clinic time, I can spend an hour with my clients and they get a full hour. They don't have the 15 minutes where I have to do the injection. Which, if I can make a comment, Michelle, in response, and goes to your point, Terry, about the capacity for deep listening. And, and, and through listening, we actually hear and understand our patients or clients' issues and challenges. Would you like to make a comment in response to Michelle? Thanks, Michelle. I think the common thread there is nurse-led. Yeah. I'm back on my soapbox again. You're overseeing their treatment, right? And that's it's great to hear. I think, you know, we're very good at it and we should be doing more of it. Add on to this question here. Am I still in the thunder no, no. Sorry. <laughs> Advice for opening, I'll hand over to Terry in a minute, but I'd just say that um, keep an eye on Dana's social media for this because we usually put out the papers once they're published, but we've got some good data on it. And hopefully when we have the dollar argument, it's going to make a lot more sense because we are cost effective. We are very good at what we do. Once we start building those arguments, I think it'll be a bit easier to argue for these type of clinics, but I'll hand over to Terry for the practicalities. You're not going to say don't do it. <laughs> no, we're not going to say don't do it. No, um, yes, do it. Um, I've done a business uh, case to my, my, for my CEO. So basically how it works is that if you're in a rural community, you can get funding for a specialist clinic. So not only do you receive your Medicare rebate, you get a um, quite a substantial amount per client you see. So immediately their eyes light up and immediately you can kind of get it going. And one of the one of the one of the great things is I'm in with lots of other specialists. So I'm not like in the AOD bit. So patients really like that because they say, oh, well, we come to a really nice place. Yeah. Yeah, so basically it's about selling them and selling, you know, selling them that, you know, they're going to be getting a lot of money through that. Plus, they're seeing the knock on effect in ED. So, I mean, not only with, um, you know, if someone comes into opioid withdrawal in ED, I can actually give them an injection in clinic. So we've done that before. Yeah. 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 Cool. I also to Spruik Dana, we've also got a, a guide for opening private practice for nurse practitioners. And we also have a program, I know a few people have completed it here, for a mentoring program for nurse practitioners as well, which has just had a successful pilot run and is about to have another program. So I know that's just for nurse practitioners, but we're looking to expand it. But if you are a nurse practitioner looking to open your own clinic, I would say check those resources out. Uh, are there any plans to survey the local injecting drug community about the use of the NSP? Not so much the NSP, but we are going to do some qualitative work to talk to them about their experiences of being on the long-acting injectable in Terry's clinic. And through that, we'll also talk about the use of the NSP as well to try and hopefully follow up on the numbers that we've seen. It's a good way to knock some of these confounding issues on the head as well. Does that answer that? Just wondered if there was any, if you looked at wastewater, if there was any decrease there. Okay. We couldn't get it. Yeah. We did try. And um, yes. Basically, to do it, any any nurse can give the injection, and um, there's a sh there is a short training and um, video you can you can actually access. And there's something you have to do. I can't remember exactly what it was, but you had to go on to um, Vic Health and just say that you'd done the short training course, and that's it. And gets and basically um, get someone to show you a couple of times, and then you're away to go. And get a supervised one as well, just to make sure. But you know, you you can just do it. I I actually prescribe to people, and um, I I do the prescription, and then sort of really more of the outlying communities in Gippsland. And um, I send the prescription, and a nurse down there 
or a bush nurse can do it for me. Any more? Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Adam. Please join me in thanking our presenters. The last final keynote speaker is um, going to be on medicinal cannabis. And um, I'm Michelle Pickley. I, I know a lot of people in the room because I've been around the traps. You can see with the colour in my hair. I've been around the traps for a number of years. And um, I'm a nurse practitioner um, in addiction and mental health at a community health service in Hawthorne. So I'm a, I used to be at Western Health, um, so I know the clientele there, but I'm a bit more fortunate because um, I get a lot of the worried well, a lot more affluent types of um, clients in Hawthorne. Um, who are addicted to um, opioids. Um, and a lot more people are starting to even ask about the medicinal cannabis and inquire about it because they've got a lot more disposable income. Okay, so I'm going to introduce um, Simone O'Brien. Simone's a nurse practitioner spe specialising in palliative and can um, cannabis medicine with a focus on improving quality of life. She has completed her master's, obviously, in nursing as a nurse practitioner, and she completed that in 2009 and was endorsed in 2013. Simone spent 30 years working in rural health setting across acute emergency, aged care, palliative and community care, as well as in women's sexual and reproductive health and forensic nursing. Okay, so as you can see from our slide, she's from Heathcote Health um, in rural Victoria. She is a current member of the Australian College of Nurse Practitioners, Australian oh. Primary Healthcare Nurses Association, Australian Medicinal Cannabis Association, and the Society for um, Cannabis Clinicians. She currently uh, runs a specialised therapeutic cannabis practice. And I'll hand you over to Simone. Thanks, mate. Thanks, that gave me a hot flush. I sound like a wanker. <laughs> I'm Simone. I work at Heathcote Health. I'm a nurse practitioner. In the last few years, I've specialised in medical cannabis and I do it intensely, okay? I'm here to talk to you. I'm only going to talk for about 20 to 25 minutes um, because I know you're all going to have a heap of questions for me. I get questions wherever I go. So I'm just going to cut through what I do, talk about cannabis because you guys are the future. You're the ones who are going to take it out. It's the nurses who are going to lead cannabis forward. It's not the doctors. So I want you all to really just take it all on board because I just want to dispel a lot of the stigma around cannabis. <clears throat> so... I've got some notes mainly to keep me on track. Um, so that's me. I work in private practice Monday and Fridays. Uh, Tuesday to Thursday, I'm at Heathcote Health. Heathcote's up in central Victoria. It's a little country town. We're a small rural health service. So 10 years ago, I was endorsed as a rural nurse practitioner. Now, what that means is that we do probably how I describe it is we do a lot, a, a little bit of a lot and we know when to hand over and who to call. Um, and we know we have really good contacts. So my specialties, I've got quite a broad scope. I work across our urgent care, our aged care. I do all the end of life care at home in the community, but I don't do the bed-based stuff. I do the, the people who wish to die at home, I'll look after them. And in the last couple of years, I've incorporated cannabis into my toolkit, and I call it a toolkit, my prescribing toolkit. Um, and it's worked a dream. I'm currently undertaking my psychedelic studies at the moment um, in the hope that they will fortunately, hopefully be down scheduled next year. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to give a shout out to Lucy Haslam, who in 2016 drove the uh, decriminalization of medicinal cannabis and then the legalization of cannabis for medicine. 
a um, couple of weeks ago, she asked me to set up, to help her set up and to lead the newly formed Australian Cannabis Nurses Association. So I encourage you all to, I've just set up, we'll be launching next year. Um, I've just set up landing pages on Facebook and things like that just to gather nurses, so one of the things we'll be looking at next year is I really want to get some guidelines into the in, in for nurses um, so that nurses know how to become a cannabis nurse, how to work in the cannabis space, how to advocate for it, how to do dosage adjustments for patients, all that kind of stuff I'm doing now that I don't really want to keep doing. This is, this is nurses' work. This isn't my work. You guys are capable of doing dosage adjustments and things like that but we just don't have the frameworks in place for you to do that. I think in a couple of years time we will and you'll be titrating patients. So, sorry, it feels weird standing here holding a microphone. Um, the endocannabinoid system, I'm actually trying pinning it on. Um, the way I describe this to my patients, it, it, this is the basis of cannabis. This is Cannabis 101 is this slide. So I say to my patients, I'm not treating your pain. I'm not treating your addiction. I'm not treating whatever it is that you're wanting cannabis for. I'm treating your endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system is a large, I say to my patients, I, I, I like feathers. So I say it's a large feathery receptor system. And it is feathery. I've seen pictures of it. It's long. It's It's everywhere. We have billions of uh, receptors in our brain. Um, it's multifunctional. A lot of it is re via retrograde signaling. It works uh, in the brain's spinal cord and it interacts with all our neurotransmitters. We also make our own cannabinoids. So when we are deficient in making our own cannabinoids, we can see impact on the endocannabinoid system. And that's essentially Cannabis 101. So your endocannabinoid system will be impacted by environment, by disease, by drugs, by all kinds of things. And the two cannabinoids, or our main two cannabinoids that we make are 2-AG and anandamide. And anandamide <clears throat> is uh, what we call the bliss molecule. Um, the cannabis plant. So... The cannabis plant is a very complex plant. It's made up of CBD and THC. There are a lot of minor cannabinoids too, and I will talk about them in a couple of slides. Um, this slide, I just want to have a talk about terpenes. As you can see up there, there's malt, the, the cannabis plant's full of, uh, full of lots of cannabinoids, but it's also got terpenes. All plants have terpenes. Um, so uh, as you can see up there, pine in, common in pine plants. Linalol, I think that's in lemon, uh, in, in a lot of the floral stuff. So cannabis has the same too. So when we're looking at the cannabis plant, we'll, as a prescriber, I will often look at what terpenes does it have in the plant because that is going to affect, uh, have an effect on the user. Okay, our plant properties. The plant's made up of CBD, THC. Uh, we, I talk about uh, there's two, two main types of strains. There's the sativa strain and the indica. Sativa is more of an uplifting daytime strain. Indica is for nighttime. And patients will often say, oh, <clears throat> especially people who've had perhaps a little bit of recreational experience with cannabis, they'll say, oh, I didn't like it. It just wiped me out it just you know made me sit on the sofa I couldn't move they're often the indica type strains and patients or all patients will say I tried cannabis I didn't like it because my mind raced too much they're the sativa type strains um, and then of course there's hemp and there's multiple multiple uh, cannabinoids uh, different cannabinoids in the cannabis plant we think that, that we've probably got over about a hundred and there's still more being discovered Okay, so this is just a little bit. Well, cannabis is a very complex plant. We could do a whole hour, a whole day lecture on how the chemistry of the cannabis plant. But essentially, there's the CBD, which is not psychoactive, and then there's THC, which is psychoactive. Um, they have multiple. They, they primarily interact with CB1, CB2, but there's multiple, multiple interactions at other all, all throughout the body lots of different sites at synapse sites um, it, it modulates it's it's a partial agonist for some it's an it's a full agonist for others it's it's just working in a variety of different ways all throughout your system 
The other thing about cannabis too is it's it's quite, got quite a strong uh, function with the immune system and quite supportive for the immune system. Okay, the safety of cannabis. This is some data from 2019. Um, I think I think it's around about if you wanted to kill yourself with cannabis, I think you have to sit down and eat about 15,000 kilos all in one sitting of the raw plant. So I say to my patients with, with their 30 mil bottles, I say, if you want to drink it, you can drink the whole bottle, take the whole bottle. If you want to do that, that's fine. It's going to sit you on your ass, but it's not going to kill you. Um, <clears throat> So it, it, it's safe. It's, it's a robust plant. I have caution with it in patients who have heart disease because it can trip arrhythmias, especially THC, not so much the CBD. Uh, with CBD, I will watch patients. Uh, it can drop blood pressure and it, it will interact with the CYP, en CYP enzymes. So things like your 3, 4, 5, and it, it will perhaps make, say, fluoxetine more available, methadone becomes more available. So there is interaction with other drugs via the liver with the CYPs. Um, but it's just it, it, your the cannabis prescriber will usually know what's, you know, be able to look at their medicines and say, well, it's, it's going to interact with here or it's going to make this less available or more available. Okay, we can get cannabis these days in Australia in a variety of different forms. Um, as you can see up the top there, that, that bliss one, the Ananda bliss, uh, that's a vaginal, uh, that one's uh, for vaginal application, it's for endometriosis. However, I rarely prescribe it for that. I often prescribe it for bad skin. Um, I'll prescribe it for psoriasis, dermatitis. It works a treat. Um, I also prescribe that one for... Uh, people who can't take it orally. So uh, some CBD cream works a treat on sore shoulders, sore backs. Um, you can see the oils in the middle. There's huge, there's hundreds and hundreds of different cannabis products on the, on the market. Um, you can purchase it in herb or bud or flower. Um, in, the, in, in the cannabis industry, we call it flower because it's perhaps a little bit more professional than bud or we call it herb. Um, the oil down the bottom there, the humicology oil is a really good example of how they're quite hybrid now. So the oils will have, that's, that's quite a good quality oil. It's quite a strong CBD. It's got 200 milligrams per mil of CBD. It's also got a base of about three milligrams per mil of THC. And it's got a minor cannabinoid in it of CBN, about 15 milligrams per mil of that. CBN is really good for migraines and really good for sleep. So um, the cannabis that we're starting to see now is becoming a little bit more tailored and you can sort of see a maturing with the companies and in the industry where they're marketing the minor cannabinoids and openly marketing the terp terpenes. And towards the end there, that uh, blend, the, <coughs> the Urban Leaf blend, that is perhaps one of the newer products on the market, that's a pen vape. So there next to it is a little vape and you buy a a reusable little pocket thing that's about $80 that you click that into, heats it up, one or two inhalations. I think it's about five milligrams of THC per inhalation, that one. And I like to say, I say to my patients, five milligrams of THC is around about one endone or one valium. It's around about the equivalence. Okay, initial consult. So I put this fellow up here because I'm going to talk about him again later on because he relates to our population. Um, so the kind of patients I see, I, I don't just see, I didn't realise it was a GIF, so sorry. I didn't realise that that was going to be repeating for the whole time that's on slide. I thought it was a standard picture. Um, so sorry about that. Um, so I don't just see patients, obviously, who are AOD clients, but I do see AOD clients. Um, I see a wide variety of patients. So I'm, I guess I'm just, I, I've tailored this slide sort of to you guys a little bit of what I would be looking for in, if there was a patient that was coming to uh, AOD client who was wanting to access medical cannabis. So firstly, it's not crisis care. You know, they have to be in a stable place, have, have a stable living environment. Um, if they're going to have a cannabis consult, um, I use a very humanistic approach, like what these guys were saying. Um, you know, most most of my patients have got trauma. I work from a very trauma informed form place. I'm a country person. I work with country people. The consultations are fairly, fairly relaxed. 
We cover past medical history, surgical history, all the usuals, medications, allergies. Do quite a comprehensive AOD history. I'm very lucky because AOD nurses are excellent. And usually by the time they get to me, you guys have worked them up and you've given me all I need to know about their AOD history. So I'm very lucky there's great AOD workers up in Bendigo. And then I'll usually do a focused assessment of whatever, you know, they're wanting to access the cannabis for, whether that's pain, anxiety, PTSD. Um, <clears throat> and an example of a pain assessment, I tend to stay away from pain scales. I talk about um, good day, bad day uh, type scenarios because pain, if anyone lives with chronic pain, you'll know you can have sort of six to eight different types of pain running, you know, at any one time. So you doing the pain scales doesn't work too well in complex pain populations. Okay, my per so my aims, when I'm sitting with these patients, um, I'm working out essentially while listening to their story, I'm thinking about what's going on with their endocannabinoid system. What do we need to treat? What, what's, what's going to be useful here? Is it the CBD? Is it the THC? Is it a combination of both? What strength are we looking at? Have they got a, a, a history where they've got quite extensive cannabis use, therefore they're tolerant and I can start quite high? Um, <coughs> So we're usually for a naive user, though I imagine in your population, the naive user will fairly will be the rare person. Um, but for the naive user, we do start quite low because people can be quite sensitive to THC, um, even to CBD when you're introducing it in a naive population. They, some people can feel that. We gradually increase the dose. We start low uh, and increase it slowly. Stabilise on a dose. Cannabis is a little bit of a tricky medicine to dose and to get right I'm fairly open with my patients and I say it's actually going to be you who gets your dosage right not so much me I'm going to give you some guidelines and I'm going to give you some start points and I'll give you an upper limit but I want you to work your way up and just get to the spot where you where, where your sweet spot is where you think that cannabis is working and <coughs> excuse me and I say to them you may not Cannabis is, it, it's again, very, it's plant medicine, very different to, to pharmaceutical medicines. I say there may be days where you don't need it. There may be days where you need half a dose. My our goal within the first month or two is that, to get them used to the plant and the medicine. That's for a naive user. For your users, for your guys, they know what they're doing. They, they, I taught, I have a very different approach with them, which I will get to. I think I've got that on a further, on a different slide because they're a separate sort of subhort who's often quite knowledgeable about cannabis. Um, so my aims and my, my goals of prescribing are sort of slightly different with them. Um, down the track, I do look at weaning off um, other relevant drugs, uh, opioids, et cetera, uh, indications for discontinuation cost and just what an average dose. I talk about average dosing with them. Um, <clears throat> What do you guys sort of think a you know a, a high dose of you know daily cannabis use is? Have you anyone who's seen clients who's got you know what would you call high? Five yeah, yeah, I'd probably call five. That's that's pushing it. I'd be wanting them to reduce that. What's sort of the average that you guys see? Are they the two to three gram users? Yeah, yeah, that's sort of that's about what I see too. And I say to them, they say to me, these some of these, you know, two gram users, they say, oh, I'm using, so they ring me up, I'm using so much cannabis. The moon. I say, look, it's not, you know, but I've had this happen, I've had that happen. I said, that's fine, that's okay. So it's just a bit, we, we keep an eye on it and we discuss it with them, but I find they're usually quite open. Uh, common side effects, these, look, it, there's, they're not huge side effects. Um, they're mainly seen in the naive users. You wouldn't be seeing them in your, your population. They Once they're tolerant to cannabis, you just don't see these side effects. Um, the rare side effects, effects that we will sometimes see in an older population, it's usually related to unstable cardiovascular disease. Uh, Hyperemesis, hyper sorry, cannabinoid syndrome. Um, some of us have a little theory about this one. Um, we wonder, I used to see heaps and heaps of it at Heathcote. Uh, we wonder whether it is to do with illicit cannabis and what the cannabis has been sprayed with, the growth hormones, the pesticides, that sort of thing that they use to pump up uh, cannabis that's grown in grow houses, essentially. So we wonder whether that's just sort of accumulation of chemicals 
we haven't really seen, there's a lot of research going into the minor cannabinoids and the TRPV uh, chemicals and receptors. And we haven't sort of seen anything that's overtly convincing that the cannabis plant can trip a hyperemesis hyper syndrome. So we're actually thinking, is this, we're starting to think, is this related to actually quality of the product and perhaps pesticides and sprays? Um, in any case, it usually responds really, really well to haloperidol. Uh, just some data. How does it work? So in around Australia, any doctor can prescribe cannabis as long as they've done the course. And in some states, nurse practitioners can prescribe. It's a Schedule 8. It's ideally sublingual if it's an oil. Um, there is some topical benefit as well. I say to my patients, there's not an orifice. You can't put this in. Don't ring me and ask me if you can put it on your skin. You can put it anywhere. Up, I say to them, you can put up your bum. Put it anywhere you want. It's compatible. It's, it goes with everything. <laughs> Um, so, so if you, you know, if you're tasty, you think, oh, I don't like to take in this orally, try rubbing it on your shoulder. Um, dosing, again, go low, start slow. Um, and it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, for some patients, I'll see it's fairly rare. Um, I will see patients that I'll start on cannabis and they'll have no response. And I suspect that it's to do with the CYP enzymes. It'll be some, there'll be a DNA reason within the CYPs of why that's not, why they're not metabolizing it. In Australia, we apply to the TGA for a SASB permit. Um, well, there's five categories, uh, per, broadly sort of speaking, ranging from very light CBD down to the strongest THC, five different categories. We apply, products all sit in, in one category. We apply and get approval in a category. Um, my prescribing probably reflects the TGA data in that uh, I probably prescribe around about 50% cannabis flour and about 50% cannabis oil. Okay, why treat with cannabis? Well, this is my why. Um, this happened to me in 2019, and this happened because I was a dickhead. Um, and I'd had a shocker of a day at work, and I was still in my scrubs and crocs and, and left work and gone out to a friend's place in Don Street in Bendigo, and it was a shit Saturday night in Bendigo. It was pissing down rain, and I drank too much red wine, and we didn't eat any food, and... We crapped on. And anyway, about eight o'clock at night when I was running down to the taxi down the slippery hill in my Crocs and scrubs, <laughs> skier's injury, straight over. So I had six months off work. I had multiple operations, bone grafts. I was at home with that external traction on my leg for two weeks. I had strict bed rest with toilet privileges only for four months. It drove me crazy. This was 2019. I couldn't move. It was the worst thing ever. So I studied cannabis because I knew what was ahead of me. And I was on all the meds. I was on the amitriptyline, the polexia, the slow acting, the long acting. I was on the long term because I had a long rehab ahead of me. So, uh, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm, this isn't going to be the rest of my life. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing the opioids. So I was on the opioids for a while because I had to be and they were the only thing that worked. So I live with this now. It's permanently in my leg. It hurts, gives me hell. Some nights I'm up at two o'clock in the morning, stretching out the leg, spasms. I've got a lot of nerve pain. That's why I say complex pain. You can nut it down into about six different categories. So cannabis has been the only thing that's helped me. It's kept me functional. It's allowed me to lose all the weight that I put on when I uh, was sick and off work for six months. And it's probably... Uh, help my mental health as well, in all honesty, because living with chronic pain is not much fun. So I, that's one of the drivers for me, especially with uh, older people when I meet them and I know that they're living with chronic pain. I understand it. And I think, well, we all, we took your opioids off you, you know, a few years back. And now you're all walking into my office like this and nothing helps you and you're miserable and you want to die and you're in your 70s. It works a treat. So I want you guys, I mean, speaking outside of your AOG population, I want you guys to advocate for this because it's a very valid analgesia for chronic pain. No good for acute pain. Very good for chronic pain. Okay, harm minimization. How do we assess who is suitable for medical cannabis? And what are the opportunities? That's what we're going to talk about next for a little bit. Okay. 
I'm going to come back to Kev. We've talked to, we've met Boomer. We're coming back to Kev too. Oh, okay. This is one of my patients in Heathcote. He recently passed away. Um, he was on cannabis for a long time as well. Uh, so the AOD population, as you know, honesty is the number one principle. I say to these people, I'm not going to judge you, mate. I just want you to be honest with me. You know, I've got, and they're fortunately very honest back. In Bendigo, it's a little bit unique, I think, and probably like all small towns, Bendigo and Heathcote. Um, I get people coming to me now because, I, and I'll say to them, how did you hear about me? And they'll say, oh, well, my dealer said I had to come and see you instead of coming to see me. So it's quite, in, in country towns, it sort of does work a little bit like that. So the way I work with this population is I follow the principles of harm and minimization for the user. And it really comes down to that individual risk assessment. So for their risk assessment around cannabis, I'm wanting to know what are you accessing? How are you accessing it? Um, what's that exposing you to when you get your product and when you get your illicit product? Do you know how it's grown? Um, do you know what it's been sprayed with? That kind of stuff. Um, there is a lot of uh, what we, what the you, illicit users will call Vietnamese grow houses or Vietnamese grow houses or Vietnamese uh, industrial sheds in Melbourne. We don't tend to see that so much up in the country. In the country, it is more uh, people just growing in their own houses, <clears throat> but still, again, using chemicals, things like that. So we do the initial risk, risk assessment. I look out for red flags. I would not be keen. I would have great hesitation prescribing THC in someone who is actively using other substances. Uh, if they were using other substances and they really had to have THC, I would want them linked in with one of you guys really closely and other allied workers as well. Um, so other substances is an, an absolute exclusion, but I would definitely want them to be in a very supported working towards other goals environment. Um, assessment, obviously, of their comorbidities and their prognosis. Uh, prognosis is a big, big, you know, can change uh, how you approach someone. A hybrid approach, I'll often, depending if there's, some, if there's some red flags, what I'll often do is I'll start them on CBD only and I'll use the THC as a bit of a carrot to get them to sort of sharpen up their act over the next few months. So and that will be right. I want you to link in, link in while up in Bendigo. It's, you know, link in with Daniel or link in with the Bendigo Community Health Guys or link in with Cam Kale. So it's, it's um, about getting them sort of linked in, using the, then the THC as the carrot and getting them to access care. Um, and surveillance, I let them know that cannabis is no different to any other Schedule 8. I can look up Safe Script and tell you tell exactly how much you're using. So <clears throat> this is the typical population. This is the typical patient I would see in an AOD population. Um, and I'm sure that all those words highlighted in red, that they're all the keywords for you guys too. I'm not an alcohol and drug nurse you know I'm not traditionally trained as an alcohol and drug nurse but I work you know work alongside them and this is what I see and I imagine that it's fairly similar to what you guys are seeing um, in that they're usually presenting they're neurodivergent they're still living at home they've usually had real chronic use these are the ones I kind of worry about because they've been using THC exclusively for a long time some of these guys have been using THC only for 20 years THC long-term use puts down deposits in our frontal cortex. If you think about the logic of it, the plant 100 years ago before it was banned, it was half CBD, half THC, uh, became politicised, was banned 100 years ago. Therefore, it becomes illicit. The CBD is bred out and becomes like moonshine, full THC because it's illicit, it has a high value. So we bred the CBD out. Um, so we know CBD is meant to work with the plant, um, uh, yeah, so I'll usually get them onto the CBD first and, sorry, I've lost my spot. Yeah, so they've usually been using since they were 15. So I get, uh, they've laid down a lot of THC, get them on the CBD to balance it out. And I explain to them too, again, endocannabinoid system. If you're using THC on an endocannabinoid system that is not toned with CBD, well, it's like that vase of flowers on the table that's got no water in it and they're drooping over the side and you're just putting drops of water in. Give it a good cup, feed your endocannabinoid system, give it the CBD. They listen to that, they understand it. Um, 
usually these patients, uh, some of these patients are coming to me because there's interface with the justice system. So they want, they've had, they've been caught with cannabis. There's been some police incident or, and then they're, they're, they're in a supported AOD program. So then they're accessing me to access medicinal cannabis and have their cannabis use perhaps better managed. Opportunities in this population is endless. These guys are really knowledgeable about cannabis. They convert over easily. Um, we have an opportunity to reset their tolerance and discuss principles of dosing. We've got a, we, we can have oversight of their usage and their grams. It legit, legitimizes their medicine. It makes them feel more valid. Um, these guys have been self-treating for years. Um, often the first question I will ask an illicit, a long-term illicit cannabis user is, what have you been self-treating? Um, and they'll, they'll tell me straight away. They'll often, they're usually ADHD, the ones because, again, it's that dopamine. They're trying to drive their own dopamine. Um, it gives them back something that has worked. It gives them something. These people, when you officiate their cannabis, they, they just can't believe it. I get them for weeks, they talk about it. They're like, I just can't believe I can, you know, carry cannabis and I'm just not going to get arrested. It's such a big thing for them. For me coming into it, because I hadn't, you know, I'd used it back in the 90s, early 90s, when I was a student and a deacon, but um, I hadn't used it since since then. So back in 2019, when I started again, I didn't, I didn't come in with that sort of, you know, worry about criminality but these guys have been doing something illegal for years it's such a stigma for them it's the illicitness hanging over their head and again the most important um medicine in their regime is actually the cbd not the thc okay we can get concession cannabis now it's very relevant for your your population because they usually have a concession card so they're eligible the ones white those ones there the ninth the six white tubs they're concession cannabis you need a concession card to access them at that price. The other two are the Humicology and the Taz Botanics, not concession, but they're quite, that's an example of sort of the cheaper end range cannabis that's around today. Humicology, excellent brand. Taz Botanics, excellent brand. So is the Med Relief. So it's, it's not like it's sort of substitute or bad quality cannabis. It's excellent medical grade cannabis. So the prices are coming down. The open market is opening up. The industry in the background is actually preparing uh, for its next, next leg, which is recreational use, adult use. It will open up perhaps within the next year or two. Um, but that's the cannabis industry, industry is preparing for that market as the next. So again, in the industry, that presents a real challenge for us because we, at the moment, we've sort of got a, a little bit, I think it's probably a little bit over-regulated. The industry is probably over-regulated. I think that it should, that we could loosen it a little, but at the moment, an access point to cannabis in Australia is through a clinician. And that's good because then there's some oversight and, and we can have some regulation. Um, when you wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, certain eight, you know, obviously under 18, though I do have a couple of patients under 18, there are always circum special circumstances. Um, home environments, uh, obviously high risk behaviours, polydrug use, risk of diversion, safety of the medicines. Uh, and I've got quite a few patients who are on child protection who where we've legitimised their cannabis use, they've worked towards then getting their baby back and there's be, been reunification. Okay, I know you guys spoke about psychedelics this morning. I'm just putting this one up here as a little bit of it. It's coming on the horizons. These plant medicines, the, the patients are driving them. They're looking for them. They're turning up in our offices saying that they're using them. They're trying them. They're reading about them. Um, information is very readily accessible to patients these days on platforms like TikTok, Reddit. Um, so I think, it, I think in some ways it almost escapes us. I can feel the heat from up the back too. It's very hot. Okay, references. Has anyone got any questions? Oh, questions. That's my brother's cannabis dispensary in Ireland. He, um, and that other photo is called, uh, that photo is entitled 1901, a woman in Paris in her garden with her, with her cat and her cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> I thought all that cute. Yeah. Sorry, it's so hot up here. Oh, oh, yeah. Thanks so much.
driving restrictions? Ah, uh, very good question. Very good question. It's illegal to drive in Australia with THC in your system, except for Tasmania. You can drive, you can drive, do whatever you want down there. Um, it's just harder to get down in Tasmania. Um, illegal. So usually a lot of us, we say to the patients, we can't promise you, we can't guarantee if you are pulled up, you could be, you know, test positive. Um, some of us get around by saying to the patients, dose at night, once you're home and you don't have to drive for the day. Some patients don't give a shit and will just drive anyway and don't care. Um, it's individual risk responsibility. I, I don't see it as being any different to an opioid except that there's a test that can test for it. So I, I tested it recently. I went down to the local police station in Heathcote. I hadn't had any that morning, but I went down there and said it was about 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, look, you guys know I you know, use cannabis every night. Um, can you please test me? And they did and I was negative. But then other people have been positive. So it's just, it's such an inexact insensitive science. Um, is there any push for there to be like an exemption to the there's all kinds of things debated. So New South Wales Parliament had a debate about two weeks ago. I watched it live uh, and it was just honestly, it was like watching Australian politics. It was like watching the right just be really conservative and say that everyone's going to get stoned and get in their car and go driving. And then the left presenting the science and the rational argument. And then because New South Wales is a Liberal government, it was gone. So I think Victoria will probably, I think we'll probably get through the election. I think it will, I hope that in Victoria it will be an issue that will be resolved within 12 months. Oh, any texts? Yes. Um, go to, oh, any texts? As in textbooks. The CGP have got a really good okay. free link for yep. medicinal cannabis. And also there's a lot of the medicinal cannabis um companies yeah so i yeah i would recommend medihuana m-e-d-i-h-u-a-n-n-a medihuana for courses the australian cannabis nurse association next year or very soon will have a platform that will have a whole lot of free resources free education um it's just it, it, again early next year um, and again, yeah, a lot of the companies um, have resources in that too. And Dana, we're looking at putting something up. I don't know if it's up there, but we are thinking of putting up our time for the national conference. Yes. We're just saying, hey, we're, hey, we're all nasties. We're here to support each other. You know what I mean? We need to keep our profession alive. Yeah, and like I said, it's you guys. It's actually nurses that will yeah. drive cannabis forward in Australia, not the, not the doctors. The doctors, they, they're it's just not going to happen. They're after the cha-ching. Yeah. They're after the 15-minute consult and the factory work. Um, um, yeah. With, well, some of them are. There's a lot of nuances with yeah. cannabis and with dosing cannabis, and it's it's doesn't lend well to quick in out appointments you know especially unpacking complex symptomology things like that so you, you just can't you can't do it in it's usually longer appointments than a, what a gp is able to do uh, and yes cannabis can be used to treat mental health so cb1 is the psychoactive psychoactive one cb2 is non-psychoactive receptor cbd is excellent for anxiety mental health ptsd but so is thc thc is very good for it too Sorry? It's so, it's one of the reasons I think that there's probably no guidelines in the world about how to dose cannabis is because it's such an inexact science because of the endocannabinoid system. So someone like me, who's been using it since, you know, about 2020. You might get to go home early. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. So Cam Kale, does anyone know Cam up in Bendigo? He's a drug and alcohol nurse practitioner. Lee Kennedy, another uh, AOD, I think. Um, Cam sends me a lot of patients to uh, that are transitioning with um that one you were talking about, yeah. not the Suboxone, what's Sublocade? Sublocade. Yeah, that one. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry, I can think of the name. Points of don't lunch. It's no rep. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I couldn't think of it. Sorry. Um, yes, it goes beautifully. We'll often just take all that rough edge off. It just rounds it out. Not, yeah, just settles it all down. Cannabis just work, it works everywhere. So you're giving CBD, it will work for anxiety. It can work for your gut. It stops, you know, they, they're not constipated anymore. Sort of has a little bit of a broad, can have a bit of a broad brush effect. Michael's phone. Oh, Michael's phone. Oh, Yes. So would you avoid teenagers because of the plasticity of the brain? That's a really good question. Um, technically, yes. Technically, yes. However, however, there are always exceptions. I have a couple of young boys on my books who have not had any luck with any mental health services in Bendigo despite serious suicide attempts and long stays in ICUs. Where then they're home within three months, they've been discharged from CAMS because they don't want to take their serical because it's making them too blunted and they feel shit. So then they go and pick up their bong again and they start smoking for about six months and they exit all the systems and the systems go, no, I don't want to know you because you're 16 and you're smoking dope and you're just doing the worst thing for your health. And then their mothers contact me and their mothers are usually about my age and their mothers are like, Simone, I'm beside myself. What am I going to do with my son? So we get them onto the CBD. We do, they're usually all ADHD. Send them off to an ADHD doctor, get the diagnosis, get... So it's that kind of stuff. Then some of them do need THC. We add it back in once they've got their CBD regulated and they've had assessment you know, other workups, other assessments. So it's never sort of just that singular in isolation. Here's your THC. Sorry. Oh, that might be our... We'll be getting the evacuation warnings. Yes. Uh, the cannabis, yes, has to be done carefully. People uh, people on long-term... Yes. You can. Works very well. Do you get the one I know? Did we answer this one on the screen? Yes, you can. If some, yes, is there a swap over? You can. Yes, uh, I usually say allow a month or two and you, to iron it out, but absolutely. And one more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't come and see me! Don't come and see me on my website. There, I'm, I'm booked out till like, I'm not opening my books till next year. Um, on my website, I have put some really, really good nurse prescribers on there that are Victorian and a couple of clinics as well. Um, if you go to, if you just go to mcnp.com.au, I think it was on there, um, just go to the blue bar up the top where it says, I'm not taking any patients and click on that. And there's some excellent nurse pracs around doing it. But just, they'll, they, yeah, it's ridiculous coming to see me. And just an answer to that, the charge. Oh, uh, you, you'll find most appointments actually, the clinic, this is a little bit of a back doorway. Um, for your patients, I would recommend, if you are wanting to get them started on CBD, I would recommend a clinic called Humankind Clinic. They are in Queensland. They use the Humacology oil and it's an excellent oil. They offer free appointments. So you're only paying for your oil. So for a poor population that you think, look, I really, this patient's just going to need some CBD. That's a really cheap, fast, quick way to get them CBD. No, 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 telehealth. It's, yeah, no, everything's telehealth. So I don't know why you think we're still traveling. It's telehealth. Everything's telehealth. Yeah. You don't, you're not confirming, you're not doing new diagnostics for cannabis. You're confirming old, di they're presenting with you, I've got pain, I've got this. So you're not diagnosing new conditions. There's also uh, um, Dr. James. Um, oh, James Stewart. Stewart. Yeah, he's with, uh, he's, yeah. yeah. And he's doing um, clinics as well. Yeah, he's in Port all, No, no, he's in Paran. In Paran. Yeah, and he doesn't charge the clients, and but and it's all Medicare. So the the trick with some of these don't charge. Uh, just a little bit of an FYI: if they're not charging, they're usually a company. If they're charging for the appointment, it will be an individual prescriber who's not affiliated. Okay. Yeah, and just again, yell out to the you know where we all are, and um, we're all on the network. 
And um, yeah, uh, if you've got any more questions, we can get you to the right person. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we've got to the end of our um, day, and I'm just going to hand over to Adam to do closure for the day before we. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Fire trucks are down there. Yeah. Just, uh, I'll be quick. I've got 20 minutes, but this isn't going to take 20 minutes. I just want to say thanks for coming again. Um, this has been a lot easier to arrange rather than the last one, which got delayed three times, I think, because of COVID. Um, James and Julia, great job again. Thank you. You do a power of work for this. And Scott, good MC. I can only aspire to be as good an MC as you, but thanks again. It's been fantastic work. And our planning committee there, Michelle, Daniel, uh, Susanna, thank you, Indivio, for sharing us all lunch. It's been great. Thank you. I just want to say what a great program. We've gone from psychedelics and trauma right through to Kamini and uh, the long acting injectable and finished up with cannabis. So I feel like we've been all around the drug world. It's been great. And if it's wet your appetite for more, there's a couple of great conferences coming up. Varda's biennial conference is finally back, which is fantastic. It's a great event in February 9th and 10th. I'm just continuing to talk while Julia pops the slide up. I reckon that guy knows he's famous now. <laughs> it's at the Pullman on the Park Gavada event, is that right? Yeah. 9th and 10th. So Vada's website's got all the details. Dana will have a table there, so I hope to see you there. We'll sign you all up. And we're also having a Dana one day event in Geelong. So anyone who's come from the surf coast, that's the 17th of March at Deakin in Warren Ponds. And both events will have fantastic speakers, I'm promised, by both committees. So I look forward to seeing you there. Otherwise, thanks for your attendance. Thank you for enjoying the program. And we have some drinks and nibbles, I believe, now that we're allowed to stay in the building. <laughs> Or were they in the were they in the microwave that just went up in flames? <laughs> so yeah, hang around for some networking, drinks, and nibbles. And oh, before we go, we've got one more Mentimeter. Your most important take-home learnings from today.